Ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the, uh, the late start, and uh, welcome to this session. Thank you for joining us. You know, we have a lot of sessions uh, running in parallel this morning, so uh, appreciate you joining us uh, for this session on expanding access to affordable and reliable ICT infrastructure and services. Uh, this is a, a critical element, of course, in e-commerce. If you haven't got a connection, you've got no e-commerce. So we start really from the point of providing connection to people. And uh, of course, that brings many other advantages other than just simply e-commerce. Uh, we have a statistics that show that 24% of the population in Africa is connected. So it's not a very high percentage. Uh, of course, it's much better in the urban areas than the rural areas. Uh, that's the, uh, the main uh, challenge, is to bring connectivity to the rural areas. So uh, we're going to be addressing those, those issues in this uh, session. Um, I'm grateful to uh, the, the panelists we have with us uh, this morning, experts in this field. So I'd like to thank them for, for joining us. And um, the objective of uh, the session is to discuss the key components of ICT infrastructure required to support e-commerce. And the, looking at the connectivity uh, landscape in Africa. So we look at the technical and the policy challenges that need to be addressed to provide affordable and reliable uh, services. And in particular, uh, services that can be trusted. As uh, we've heard, the issue of trust is one of the uh, key uh, challenges. If people don't trust um, purchasing online, then they won't. So we have to look at uh, uh, providing that trust. And um, so without any further delay, since we are late starting, um, by the way, we don't envisage this going on for three hours. <coughs> I think people's uh, um, ability to uh, concentrate for three hours is <laughs> somewhat limited, so we, we would expect to finish in about an hour and a half, but we'll see how we get on. Um, and so I uh, don't want to delay any further. Let me start uh, with my colleague, Marcelino Teob, he's from uh, the ITU Regional Office for Africa. Um, so I'll start with Marcelino. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I was trying to, to get the presentation, but I, I go without it. Uh, I think we are here to discuss uh, about the infrastructure, the ICT infrastructure in particular. Of course, e-commerce involves other types of infrastructures, especially on the delivery side, if it's not uh, an electronic good. It implies the postal services, delivery service, couriers, and all these sort of things. But for us here, we are talking about ICT infrastructure that is mostly used for the payments and the transactions that doesn't involve physical. The way I personally look at it, is we have three square blocks. I would call the block number one on the left side the users and application block, which is the infrastructures that will be honed and residing in the customer's premises or the user's premises, being it an ATM machine, being it a cellular, being it a laptop. Then I have the middle block that is the transport system electronically, which I call telecommunication networks. Then to the right, the third block, I will call providers infrastructure. The banks got their computers, uh, the, the goods delivery may have their storage system, everything. So these three works together. The, the core, of course, is the telecommunication that transports the information from one block to another block. If you make a phone call, 
goes for your phone to network and back to another phone. So what I was trying to show, oh, it's there now. Those are the blocks I was trying to, to show you. It is a model, simplified. Now, if you go to the telecommunication networks, I quickly went to the ITU website. There is a, what you call interactive map, which tries to track and update regularly the networks and the uh, fiber optics across the, the world. In our case, Africa. What I want to share with you is, if you look at the amount of submarine cables that we have in Africa, it's quite substantive. We have countries with two or three landing points, countries with one landing point, but I hardly see any country at the coastal area which does not have a landing point. The issue is from the landing point to the interland or to the interior of the country. Then you start seeing some blanks, especially on the central part of Africa. And if you can see Southern Africa, Western Africa, you've got more links. Even if you think about regional, regional network, connected countries, neighbor countries in the region, they still have links. There are some issues around the cross-border and so on, but there are something there. So the problem, even uh, just to illustrate, some countries have got rings, which makes the network some, some more reliable. If, if one fiber gets cut off, they reroute the traffic. So it's, in my opinion, quite well developed. I gave the example of Tanzania and East Africa because you are in, in East Africa. Now, what is the issue really comes through? The issue comes when you go to the rural areas. And uh, in rural areas, the return of investment may not be as attractive. The, you know, the, the, the sparse populations, the, the terrain itself doesn't encourage. So the issue is how do you bring this infrastructure to the remote and rural areas, which commercially may be perceived as less attractive. And if you look at this OIC ladder, some people prefer to work on layers. It is internet terminology and OSI. Is, is in the application layers, you know, if you go back to my three blocks, in addition to telecoms, we have those users and the service providers infrastructure that needs to be somehow uh, promoted and it is applications, are services, are uh, uh, providing of content with the local language, etc. This can boost the traffic, boost the usage, and bring more uh, return of visit even for the for, for the operators. Now, ITU is working actively trying to help their memberships by. Uh, help them to come together to get consensus the best way. Recently, this report, Measuring Information Society, has been released with very interesting statistics. One of them is around the world, more than 50% of people are connected. And the one I want to share with you is, the report says that 96% of the people in the world are connected to the mobile network there are 4% missing. And these 4%, I'm afraid when you disaggregate, they are substantially in Africa and in LDCs. Uh, also says that 90% of the population are connected to the 3G systems. When they say 3G systems, you're talking basically mobile communication, which means wireless. Sorry. No, what I'm trying to drive in is to be able to continue running or rolling the wireless systems, the frequency management plays an important role. And in Africa, we have not yet migrated to the digital broadcasting, uh, and therefore some frequencies could be released. This is one area governments and regulators should look at how to 
accelerate this digital migration in Africa to release this frequency that can be used for the wireless. Another area that we could, and the ITU is working on it, through our study groups, through our focal groups, the countries come together and they share experience. And their conclusion is the infrastructure sharing, universal service fund, the license regimes, and the PPP, public-private partnerships, should be enhanced. And the last study done under the, the LDC, study group 5.1, which deals specifically the rural, they reached the conclusion that only 33% of the strategies adopted to achieve the targets on rural and remote areas has been using universal service fund. They say that uh, public partnerships, for instance, is actually 12%, which is quite low. Tax, tax rebate comes at 6%, is a contention issue, that government maybe should look at it to promote the development. So, so I just try to share with you the graphic how these different mechanisms that should promote the rural penetration is, is really impacting currently. We also conduct a kind of a survey asking questions to the country in terms of the infrastructure that they are using to go to LDC. You find there just optical fiber are still 18%. Uh, sharing towers are 29%. So tower is a passive infrastructure. But if we have to move faster, in addition to towers, buildings, power, we need also to share other parts of active networks, like not only with, within telecom itself, but for instance with electricity companies, like integrating the rural electrification plans with the telecommunication development plan. In, I, I was told in Germany there are systems that allows anybody that wants to dig a street in a municipality, everybody else that are involved that wants to lay down infrastructure will be informed and they can take advantage of digging once, because digging is very expensive. So this is one area we should look at it to further go. So with these few words, I would like to thank you. I hope <coughs> my 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Marcelino. Um, I suggest uh, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll take them at the end when all the uh, panelists have had a chance to, uh, to speak. Um, so if you just uh, note down your questions uh, as we go along. And um, we'll take the speakers in line, uh, I suggest. So uh, next speaker is Alison Gilwald, uh, Executive Director, Research ICT Africa, University of Cape Town. And Alison has got a presentation to give. So Alison. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for coming to this session with all these competing sessions. We've got a little time and we've got lots of information to share. So I'm going to just whip through some slides to um, highlight the issues of the linkages between some of the issues we're speaking about. Um, there's a lot of focus on the high cost of data um, in Africa without very often understanding the cost drivers behind that. There's very often a discussion of the high cost without an understanding of the effective regulatory environments required in order to manage those costs and in order to um, reduce the cost of communications for the, for the economy as a whole, especially as we move into the digital economy. And of course, we are very often focusing on these supply side issues, um, but as Marcelino's um, uh, presentation showed, although we have the infrastructure coverage across large um, 
po uh, percentages of the population in many of our countries, we still aren't getting the take up. So in order to drive these services so that they are um, economic to take out to these areas, we really need to think of some of the demand side challenges, which are not only cost, but also relate to local content skills, um, shifting people from using um, the internet really as passive consumers at best, those who are online, to um, productive use of the internet um, in the context of, of e-commerce. Um, so, let's see if I can leave this here, because I can't actually see it there. <laughs> so very quickly, I'm going to um, look through the issues of um, the problems with data we've got, um, some of the barriers to take up and use, um, the problems we have in assessing affordability. So there are lots of affordability indexes, there are lots of affordability assessments, and broadly they use a, a gigabyte of data or um, some measure of, of uh, capacity as a percentage of GNI per capita. Some problems with assessing price without looking at the licensing obligations, the coverage and the quality of service that are attached to those licenses. Um, awareness of the cost drivers and the differentials in urban and rural areas. Um, the need to support operators as they transition from voice to data, um, particularly with um, financial service revenues, which are providing an important um, growth point. And then embracing OTTs in a mobile ecosystem and the achievement of, of national objectives. These are presented often as um, you know, tensions, as contradictory, whereas they actually are really driving each other extensively, um, OTTs and data and demand. Um, and then creating a certain environment for network investment, which we have to continue to do, especially in this mobile environment that we're so dependent on. We've got these constant new investments required in next generation networks that require that we have a, an um, enabling um, political policy and regulatory environment for them. And then we really need to um, do this very difficult thing of um, completing our first round um, sort of competition reforms in an environment that's changing very rapidly and being aware of new competition issues that arise in a digital economy that create new tensions around competition, competition markets and make them very difficult to define and negative or instrumental implementation of traditional competition rules in a platform economy can have very um, negative impacts on, on innovation um, and on a lot of the activities that we're wanting um, or outcomes that we're wanting in a digital economy. And then if I have time, I'm going to quickly look at alternative access strategies, which will be very difficult. Um, but I just wanted to point out some of the problems with, with the data we have in Africa, the data we have in the global south, and the problems of depending on the supply side data that we have, and that's really often all we have, um, and is the kind of data that's largely used in the um, report that Marcelino's announced that the ITU IDI um, index that's just come out for this year, um, which is really only the only global um, database that we have or do, um, global indicators that we have um, for a growing number of indicators as we move from more traditional services to um, digital services. But you can see from this slide, if you can, in fact these front rows aren't reserved and we could actually all be much closer for our conversation, but if you can see, um, you'll see that there's um, a number of, uh, uh, of the bars on here which are referring to the red bar is the Research ICT Africa data from our latest 2017-2018 nationally representative um, household and use surveys. And the gray bar is the um, ITU data from the 2017 um, data, so not the latest ones that just come out this week. And then the... Um, uh, other um, um, figure that's moving across it is the number of duplicate SIMs. So the problem is in a prepaid mobile market, we have no way of identifying unique subscribers other than through demand-side surveys. And that's why we work very closely with the ITU on trying to reconcile this data um, in order to understand better how many unique subscribers we have. So before we, when we were still in a voice environment with enormous interconnection problems, we had five, six 
um, duplicate SIM cards in East Africa, across East Africa. Um, whereas now, in a data environment, as some of the um, pricing issues have settled, and of course connectivity issues are resolved, but in the data environment, obviously it's a different issue, um, we have a, on average sort of two to three duplicate SIMs. So this really affects the number of people who are really connected to the internet, and you'll see why the real figures are so much lower than the supply side figures that come from the mobile operators that are effectively just number of SIMs in the market and that are put through the regulator as administrative data that is taken um, to the UN. And of course, in this um, environment, this prepaid mobile environment, where all you have is a SIM number that doesn't tell you um, if it's a multiple SIM, but nor does it tell you if it's a man or it's a woman, um, if it's a low-income person or um, what education levels they have, etc. It's absolutely uh, you know, impossible to get that information for policy planning without these nationally representative surveys. So the ITU does have manuals and training on how to do this, and we work with them in doing them in some parts of the continent, but unfortunately only 10 this round, and we really need to work with national statistics officers um, and um, uh, national regulators and ministries to, to get this information, because we really don't know where we are. We don't know how far off we are from the SDGs, other than we're, we're too far and we're not going to make it. Um, so I'm going to be referring to data that was actually um, part of this 10-country uh, African survey that I mentioned is actually part of a Global South survey um, called the After Access Survey, um, done with our partners in Learn Asia and um, Dersi in LATAM, um, and is funded by the IDRC and Swedish um, uh, International Development Agency, which I should thank enormously because we are unable to get the support at the government level that we need to undertake this work. Um, and of course, we've had some support in some of the countries from the ITU. Um, so if we look at this um, figure, which is really useful in locating um, African countries within the global south, particularly for countries like um, South Africa, which always score you know, very uh, high up in a lot of these um, indicators. Um, you know, basically at internet we have about 50% of the population connected, way higher than many of the other African countries which we're looking at, where we've got Nigeria, Kenya, um, uh, Tanzania around, uh, sorry, Kenya and Ghana, and Nigeria around 30%, uh, Ghana and Kenya a little bit lower, and then we've got very much lower the countries, the least developed countries, um, Tanzania at 14, Uganda um, at 14, and um, uh, Rwanda and Mozambique at 10, and Rwanda even less than 10. And I'm, I make this point because, of course, as Marcelina was showing, there have been these enormous supply-side interventions in Rwanda, um, but they haven't been able to address these demand-side challenges that they're clearly facing in Rwanda with less than 9% um, of the population um, connected in, in 2017. It obviously has gone up a little, I should imagine, but they are facing really sort of serious intractable problems. And I should say that those least developed countries um, uh, Rwanda also has the highest gender gap. So we do see when we look at gender that um, as the uh, internet penetration and mobile phone penetration tracks um, GNI per capita, with basically the richer countries being more connected than the poorer countries, so we find the gender gap does too, because of course as more people come online, the gender, par the gender parity is improved or gender parity arises. Um, so this is an important challenge for us from a policy point of view and a connectivity point of view, but really highlights um, in our modeling that the real challenges around connectivity are not around the technology and not around the things that's around um, education and income. And so, you know, we're really addressing a classical um, human development challenge here. I just want to make the point, because there is so much focus on gender, and there should be, um, that in fact the rural and urban divide still remains across most countries a far bigger divide, a far bigger challenge. And that is not only because of the economics or the uneconomic areas that... Um, you know, private companies are un unable or unwilling to go into or aren't required to go in by their licensing requirements. Um, but it's also because this is a ch classic poor problem. The people who are not connected to the internet are the poor. Um, they're not connected to the um, internet in, in urban areas, um, or they're less connected in urban areas, but they're most um, unconnected in rural areas. And obviously where you have intersections of um, uh, poverty, of income, of education, low education levels, of gender, these are the people who are, are most um, disconnected. 
just to reinforce um, Marcelino's point about the problems with um, electrification and this actually being a major challenge for us, particularly as we move into the um, digital economy and the requirements of big data warehouses, um, of blockchain, for example, all requiring massive amounts of, um, of power, of energy, um, and yet large numbers of people are not connected on the continent simply because they cannot charge their very small um, um, mobile device or there isn't electrification for the rollout of mobile stations. Um, so just to look at the, the, the main problem, this is the point I want to make, is that one of the main barriers is actually the, the, that people have no, no, no device. And the main reason for them not having this device is that they cannot afford it. The large numbers of people who are not online, um, in Mozambique, for example, 76% of people um, say who aren't online, remember that only 10% are online, say it's because they cannot afford the device. Um, Rwanda, 42%. 50% in South Africa who aren't online now look like the rest of Africa that aren't online, all the same problems, price problems of, with the devices, 36%. Tanzania 64, etc. Another one, of course, is a big um, barrier is that people simply don't know what the internet is. And so again, remember, it's of the people who are not connected. So in South Africa, oh, so we haven't got the f um, figure there, but in Senegal, it's um, of the people who are not connected in Senegal. And I should point out that Senegal is actually quite an interesting um, performer outside of its, its, its uh, GNI per capita range, so it performs much better than some of the countries that are actually a little wealthier um, than it. So there's some interesting lessons to be learned from there. Um, just to make the important point about um, getting people connected is, all, is also about wider um, financial inclusion, about wider social and economic inclusion, and particularly financial inclusion. And obviously, as we move into a digital economy, the financial instruments that are available for people to participate in this economy is absolutely critical. And I just want to highlight, for example, um, the very, very poor mobile take-up in Nigeria, where in both South Africa and Nigeria, we have relatively um, banked, underbanked, but banked populations um, with very um, tight uh, financial regulation. And this has actually inhibited mobile takeoff. It actually was in um, East Africa where you had less tight financial regulation that was actually able to take off. But as long as, you know, Nigeria has this um, push for financial inclusion, for get mobile money going, unless it um, uh, makes a, you know, a, a different plan, we, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, and uh, also very, very critical in supporting a very, very bleak um, uh, ITT environment in Nigeria where people, uh, where, where, where some operators are exiting the market. There's actually been no investment in that market for five years other than the spectrum that MTN um, was the only default bidder for in connection with its... Um, its uh, penalties that it had to pay. So very important to look at the linkages between mobile money revenues as operators move from voice um, to data in order to get those broadband network investments out into the rest of the country. So um, um, uh, Nigeria, for example, really once one is out of the major, 12 major urban centers, there is very, very little um, intercity connectivity in those areas. And just to make the point about the importance of the smartphone devices, smartphone penetration is almost um, directly correlated with internet um, take up. And again, just because there have been strange figures floating around, and we've had you know, people at very high level panels talking about 50% mobile phone penetration in Kenya. It is simply not the case. And we cannot address the problems that we're facing. In Kenya, we've kind of hit a wall. From 2017, sorry, from 2012 to 2017, we've only had about one and a half, two percent growth in internet. So we were already at 27 percent during that bubble, um, Kenyan bubble, and uh, two year, um, sorry, three years on, four years on, we were only two percent more. So we've kind of hit a wall at 28 percent, where the people who could afford services are online and the rest are offline. And it's not about coverage, not about a whole lot of other things. We've got to do some things um, quite different there. And one of them is getting the price of um, uh, smartphones down so that people can um, uh, uh, access the internet. Just very quickly, it's important to remember in this environment, which we don't when we're doing, you know, our hashtag data must fall, is that we do have very high costs. Um, lot, a lot because of our, I'm um, sorry, that should be um, our currency dollar um, exchange rate. It's far worse for many other countries than South Africa, Nigeria, etc. 
Um, we need to look at the very high cost of inputs, of power, um, particularly has this inflationary effect on data prices that we spoke about. And then we need to look at the regulatory um, cost drivers. So the inability of operators to get the appropriate spectrum at a reasonable price that they don't have to pass on to end users is absolutely critical as well. And then, of course, we've got very serious regulatory and institutional challenges, um, failure to effectively regulate the sector. So although we very often have institutions in place, we very often have the law in place to demand the data that we need from operators in order to assess the markets. We've got the powers to do market reviews and assess dominance, but in many environments, we're not doing that. And this has become absolutely critical in this data environment that we're in, that we have to have high quality data. That is the distinguishing characteristic I'll show you with the pricing data that even where people are able to access much lower prices but of a lower quality, they are not voting with their feet and going to those services. They're paying the premium to be on quality networks where they can firstly get a signal in, their, in a rural area that they might not get from that low-cost operator and that they've got a quality signal that allows them not to time out of their cloud services or whatever it is. So especially as we're looking at the commerce side of it, at the business side of it, um, the issue of um, quality and dominance in the market is absolutely critical because the dominant players in the market are the, are the players who are able to reinvest in the network and doing a fabulous job, um, providing better service, and therefore being able to outcompete the new entrants that simply cannot um, provide that quality. And so we need to look at wholesale regulation, we need to look at access regulation while not disincentivizing investment. And then just um, very high secondary taxes and excise duties. I know we've got other sessions on that. But um, to really um, to, to put social networking taxes on the thing that is driving internet take-up, that is social networking, is really to, to, to stab oneself in the foot. So countries that are doing that need to look at the counterproductive impacts um, of that. I'm not going to say anything more about the international bandwidth because Marcelino has given us a very good view of that, but as he points out, the challenge is now really around national transmission. International bandwidth um, five, ten years ago in some countries was the main cost, was 80% of the cost of ISPs in order to bring services into the country, and 20% was the local cost. Now it's almost inverted in many countries. International bandwidth is really freely available with the competition on the, comp on the continent, um, but we've got big challenges around intercity routes and, of course, fiber um, uh, um, in metros as well. But there have been incredible backbone and backhaul investments, fiber investments, especially for companies that are operating across the continent that really can be leveraged for um, delivery to public to, to underserviced areas through the aggregation of public demand and the um, putting out to tender smart procurement of services of operators who are already out there and who capitalize their network by investing in that network, getting as much traffic onto it so effectively they open access networks so that they can extend those networks. Um, just to talk very, very quickly, because I know that um, we are out of time, um, is that we put out, um, at Research ICT Africa, we collect quarterly the price of every voice and data product that is on um, the, um, on the web that is advertised um, for 50 countries across the continent, and we track um, the movement in these prices. And um, what has become very clear over the, as we've moved into the data environment, that um, one is very often not comparing apples with apples, that one um, gig of um, uh, data at the time that we found Cameroon at the top of our, our index um, was not the same as one gigabyte of data in South Africa, for example, that I'm familiar with. Um, when we investigated the case with our Cameroonian partners, we found that that one um, gig was actually 2.5. So it was edge technology, basically, and it was a desperate attempt by those operators to try and hold on to the market when um, Viatel was being brought in with an exclusive 3G license, which had failed to get mobilized and really created a very negative impact on the, on the Cameroonian market. So very critical to get that competitive regulation regulatory environment correct, but also for us to assess performance. So some of the countries that have the lowest prices here, fortunately, have the lowest prices because they've got countries that, um, you know, they've got populations who can't afford those services. But we have to find a model that allows reinvestment of, into networks. So for example, Nigeria has very low prices at the moment. In fact, they, one would argue there's a price war on, and prices have been driven right down. But there is nothing to reinvest in those networks. And so as I said, we've not seen the networks investment, and we've actually you seen operators um, exiting the market or selling off their local market shares. Um, 
So just the point I wanted to make about the pricing is that we've got to look at it very critically. We've got to look at it very granularly. The granularly, granularly, you know what I mean. Um, uh, and, and look at what the, really the effective price is. So in Africa, people don't buy one gigabyte of data. They buy little bits of data um, that are on specials, that are on promotions, and then they access their social networks and, and use their services that way. I think I've actually missed a slide. So I'm, I'm just going to raise it here because it's a very critical point that shows, I mentioned it, but it shows um, not only the direct correlation with smartphones um, and internet take up, but also social networking. And this is absolutely um, critical to understanding the, the business model and how it works and how important it is to embrace OTTs um, in these um, environments, especially for digital economy, um, but also because um, well, you know, what our qualitative work shows is that people are so, um, using social networking in order to reduce their data costs. So they are buying what is quite expensive small data bundle, but then they're using that in order to use free WhatsApp services to communicate um, on social networks, free basics, etc. So it's a critical communication tool for them. Um, and uh, also, I should point out, because there's such a negative social networking um, concern among governments, is that it's also become a critical commercial um, uh, platform for operators, and I should point out for governments. So the Mozambican government, for example, um, moved from their website or kept their website but moved to a Facebook book, book page for their agricultural program, for their extension offices, et cetera, for their um, marketing and pricing, and they've got you know, multitudes, I can't remember the exact figures, um, more than they had on their websites. Um, and then the other thing I just want to mention, because it is quite completely critical, I did mention it up front just in case I didn't get a chance, but absolutely important, absolutely critical to understand prices in relation to policy outcomes. So policy outcomes are not only about affordability. Policy outcomes are about affordable access, okay? So we need to look at what the combined factors are that contribute to this. And if a country has quite high prices, it may also have quite strong um, obligations on operators to meet coverage and network um, um, measure, measurements that will ensure that people at least can get access to the service if they can afford various other things. So it's important to look at those. Many countries have only got, you know, Uganda, for example, only has 50% um, 3G. So we've got um, digital um, Uganda vision coming out with an intention to have all schools registering, all pupils registering online. Um, in 2019, but actually the network is only covers 50% of the population, and mainly um, the urban areas and mainly um, Kampala. So these are big problems. And then, as I said, the quality of service is becoming the critical flip side, and this is not only a, a, a digital economy issue, so that we've got decent connectivity and we can do um, e-commerce and e-services and you know, cloud ser um, services that will make our businesses more productive, etc. But it's also a critical competition issue, because the dominant operators are providing the best quality and they're attracting and retaining um, the customers. Um, and so you're not getting very good competitive effects there, no pricing pressure. Um, and then the other critical issue is um, uh, also to look at our environment. A lot of the studies that are done around um, penetration demonstrate that you have to have, sorry, penetration and uh, um, um, GDP, per, uh, GDP growth, um, uh, growth in the economy, you have to have it reached a certain kind of critical level, um, 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 critical mass, in order to enjoy the network effects that go with this. And we see that um, many of the countries I, I spoke about um, are way below this 20%. This so even though they are, have got policies to try and embrace the digital economy, they're not going to be able to see those productivity gains, etc. Um, so I, I'm not going to speak any more about the quality of service because we're done. Just to be very important about the um, unintended consequences of, of, of um, different kinds of competition and sector regulation that may impact negatively both on consumer welfare, if you tax social networks, and also on innovation um, in the economy if you do more instrumental regulation. And the last point I just wanted to make is that basically we have to look at a model and um, what we've got now, people cannot afford. Those people who are not in line cannot afford what we've got now. We have to have a, a, a policy and licensing and business model framework that takes the existing rollout of the networks, which has been extraordinarily successful, enables them to continue to invest, but actually looks at complementary access, lower cost technologies, 
um, dynamic spectrum use that can be um, uh, interfaced very nicely with 5G, we know already, but could already be done in rural areas where there's actually um, not a lot of use um, already going on. Community networks where they're um, already ready to operate and ready to scale. Um, public Wi-Fi in order to provide compl complementary um, access for people who, who simply will never be able to afford the kind of um, GSM services that we're offering now. Thank you, and thank you for the <coughs> indulgence. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. A tremendous amount of uh, information there for us to uh, digest. I think it will take quite some time to digest all that. And I'm pleased to, say, to tell you that uh, the presentation, her presentation and um, all the presentations uh, in this session uh, will be available on the, uh, the website for this event. So... I'm sure you would like to look back on, on some of these uh, statistics and, uh, and slides at your leisure later. Uh, but again, uh, if you could keep any, any questions uh, for when we get to the end of uh, uh, the interventions by our panelists. So uh, next, uh, I'll turn to Benoit Bazan, the Development Advisor for the International Cooperation and Development uh, part of the European Commission. So, Benoit. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've had a very enlightening uh, presentation now showing the uh, extent of the issue that we are facing. If we understand that the ongoing revolution, uh, digital revolution, uh, will be a key factor to allow Africa to, uh, to come out of poverty. And uh, allow me then to remind uh, the, the framework in which the European Union uh, support is provided is definitely we are providing support in order to reach uh, the sustainable development goals. And what we see is that if we want to reach them, then we need to change the scale. We need to change from millions of investment to billions of investment. Uh, and this will only be possible if we find partnership, if we find uh, private sector uh, link with other financial institutions has the way to really um, increase our investment. And in the digital sector, we believe that the EU may have a very um, important um, say, I would if I may, mostly because uh, we are also, uh, we have lived in a way part of this revolution. It's not finished for us either. But I think the uh, single market that we've been able to establish at European level can be uh, an, um, an incentive and a reflection also from the errors that we have made. Uh, as the uh, vice, vice president mentioned yesterday, I think it is important to learn from what we have been able to do and what we have uh, failed in, in, in many instances. So the uh, European Commission is uh, effectively now committed to mainstream digital technologies uh, and services for its development policy. And we have identified four key areas for intervention, which are very much the one which have been already spelled out during the uh, first two days, which are basically access to open, affordable, and security connectivity, digital literacy, literacy and digital skills, digital growth entrepreneurship, and in particular, targeting women. Uh, it's for the European Commission very important to ensure that this gender divide uh, is tackled from the very beginning of the situation and then to consider digital technology as an enabler for uh, other sectors. So that's why in September in his uh, speech uh, to the European Parliament, the President of the Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, has launched this new uh, Africa-Europe Alliance for Sustainable Investment and Jobs. I think the idea there is really to uh, take our partnership for investment and jobs to a next level. 
we need to change the way we've been interacting with our partners in Africa. And uh, so what we have done so far is trying to uh, ensure a proper communication at continental level. We have seen, and I think your presentation was very clear on that, is you can uh, tackle internet connection at country level. But if you really want to make a difference, and if you want to make a difference also for e-commerce, we have seen yesterday and the day before in the different presentation, that it is important to have a continental approach. And I think the, um, this conference here is, is one step. If it can help um, opening discussion on a, an harmonized uh, single digital market in Africa, it would be a very a good result. The uh, European Union is uh, launching the so-called uh, EU Africa um, Digital Economy Task Force in next week in Vienna during the uh, summit between the uh, EU and uh, the African partners. This task force is composed of partners from Africa and from Europe representing financial institutions, African development banks, other banks, um, private partners, both from Africa and from Europe, and representative of governments. The objective uh, there is to um, find out, to, to, no, to prepare a recommendation for uh, policy measures that can support African development and pan-African digital integration also to look at uh, development assistance interventions that uh, can support the development of the digital economy in Africa. So the uh, European Commission is uh, going through the discussion of its next uh, multi-annual financial framework, which means the uh, budget for the next uh, six years, 2021, 2027. And this is for us a very critical moment because it will define the key orientation, and one that has been already put on the table is the need to invest in digital uh, infrastructures. But what we see is that it's not only digital infrastructure that are needed, and I think also the previous intervention was very clear on that, is we need to have a number of uh, gaps filled in order to be able to make a real difference. And when we were uh, presented e-commerce experience yesterday from the private sector, many of them have already alighted issues like transport, connectivity, logistics, but also energy. So I think if we want to make a difference, we need to invest into digital infrastructure, but we also need to make sure that the services for the use of these infrastructures are also being put together. And I think transport and logistics for e-commerce is critical. Energy is definitely an issue, and especially in rural areas. So we would like to make sure that these are also uh, tackled. And along this investment, we should also make sure that we provide the education and the skills um, to, to everybody, you know. The, uh, the figures you were mentioning on how many people are not aware about internet or don't see any interest in internet shows that there is a, a real need to, to do something on education. But it is also about improving the business climate. If you want to uh, attract investment or if you want to support startup in Africa to uh, grow and to access the African market, you need to have an improved business climate across the continent. And this brings, without saying that, the economic integration within Africa is very important. As uh, it was also uh, mentioned yesterday, the, most of the, uh, the trade is happening between an African country and an outside partner. And I think we need to make sure that the intra-African business is also growing. And finally, and not the, the least, is it is key to ensure that we support digital startups and entrepreneurship. 
also including women. Just in, in a nutshell, I would like to present three interventions that the European Union has been uh, working with, with the partners here. One is the uh, multinational trans saharan backbone, which will link Algeria, Niger, Nigeria, and Chad. So this uh, optical fiber cable will allow uh, in improving the intracontinental communication. The other one, uh, and this is a program which is implemented uh, <coughs> through the uh, African Development Bank, where the Commission is, is providing support. I think another important uh, piece of infrastructure is this uh, Central Africa backbone, which will uh, revive the Republic of Central African uh, connectivity but also allow countries to link inside the continent. And the last one, which is for us very important, is this policy and regulation initiative for Digital Africa, PRIDA, which uh, ITU is uh, also contributing to implement, but that we are also implementing with, directly with the African Union Commission. And I think this shows the commitment of the European Union to try to ensure that all interventions are looked at at continental level. And we hope that with these discussions, with the discussion with our financial partners, we can support making a difference by um, leveraging more resources into the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Benoit, and uh, also thanks through you to uh, the uh, European Union for uh, work uh, providing uh, some funding to uh, this project, uh, PRIDA, which ITU is, uh, is helping to implement, especially on uh, spectrum management. Spectrum uh, is a critical issue. Uh, as Marcelino mentioned, uh, still very light in Africa, switching over from analog to digital TV and benefiting from the digital... Uh, um, uh, the digital uh, dividend of uh, all that excess uh, spectrum that could be used for mobile services. So um, thanks very much for that. So um, moving on down the line to Michael Joseph Ferrantino, uh, lead economist with the World Bank. Uh, Michael, over to you. You got a presentation? Okay, it's up, yeah. And Benoit, if you have any notes you'd like to also put onto the website, um, that would be appreciated. Thanks very much. Thank you. So you've heard something about the challenges, and you've heard also something about partnerships. And so I think it's a good time to talk about what is the big challenge and what we can all do together. And the particular thing I'd like to talk about is a project that the World Bank is working on along with the African Union and many other partners, um, you know, which we call the Digital Economy Moonshot for Africa. And this partnership has a very ambitious goal that every African individual, business, and government should be in digitally enabled by 2030, and that's quite a big goal. Why do we care about that? The world as a whole is very rapidly changing as it's become digitized, and I think people are familiar with this, that as we have moved from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G, that data moves faster and faster, and we create more and more data in the world. 90% of all the digital data in the world has been created in the last two years. That's how rapidly it is exploding. Um, there were already, as of 2016, um, six billion objects of all types um, attached to the Internet of Things, and that'll be 25 billion before long. But all these things are in some sense happening in half the world, really, 
because the other half isn't connected at all. And so this is why we talk about a moonshot that, you know, Africa can, you know, there are many good things happening, but it's a time for a big push because it's actually one cannot afford to fall behind. Now, you know, there have been some fairly rapid increases in connectivity in many countries, as has been discussed already, but it's very variable depending on where you are, depending on what country and you're in, depending whether you are in rural or urban areas. In the last six years, the amount of mobile traffic on this country has increased by 20 times, and yet there are still, you know, a lot of people that are not connected at all. I won't spend a lot of time on these figures because this has been discussed. We want to talk about concepts. What is it that we need to build? And again, just reiterating some of the points here, um, the first mile of the internet, um, the part where one connects to the global network, actually is not in bad shape. You saw um, in the first presentation, the undersea cable that goes around Africa. Um, the World Bank had a significant role in financing a large part of that, not only that, but in setting up the, government arra the governance arrangements so that when that first access point hits the coast, governments commit to allow open access to multiple providers so that the physical infrastructure doesn't create a monopoly at that point. Um, in the last mile, um, many people have devices and more and more people are getting devices every day and a large you know, share of the population is within reach of the, the cellular network, so that's not too bad. In terms of putting the hardware on the ground, the middle mile, extending fiber networks into the interior of countries, building internet exchange points and so on, that is a big, big task. And we also speak of the invisible mile, which is that you need regulatory frameworks to make this work, whether these be for consumer protection, for digital signatures, um, for data protection and privacy, or to combat cybercrime. One needs institutional frameworks, and in many countries, these exist on paper, but they don't always necessarily exist, you know, or, you know, in terms of implementation. You've probably heard in several sessions already about the trust issues that exist when you buy things online, and, you know, they fall apart within a couple of days sometimes. And so one needs to have a consumer protection framework. Um, one of the areas in which Africa leads, which is a, a bright spot, is in digital financial services, not only in terms of mobile money, but in terms of some of the new type of fintech services. Um, there is actually, there is a higher share of the population that uses mobile money in Africa than anywhere else. Now, it's important to realize that that is, it's good news, but it should be put in context. Um, the, in the markets where the internet, you know, where e-commerce, e you know, first flourished, this was not the solution. People had credit cards and debit cards, and so we have issues with financial inclusion. On the back of the envelope, um, I reckon there's at least a billion people in the world that have access to the internet, but that don't have a credit card or a debit card, okay? So we have creative ways to work around that. A lot of e-commerce takes place through cash on delivery, but one of the goals of you know, this effort is to have universal financial access by 2020. Um, and when we talk about what we want to do with all this hardware, we also want to make investments in human capital and building digital skills. And you see a pyramid here and a sort of a hierarchy rather than try to read everything on the slide just to give you something to imagine. Um, the, you know, once you are using the internet in some way, 
um, there are ways to learn to use it well. So for example, um, yeah, everybody has met the business person or the government official who hands you a business card that's got an email on it, and yet when you try to communicate with that person through email, it's not effective. Um, you end up either having to call their voice line or sending WhatsApp, which is nice for some you know, purposes, but you know, somewhat problematic when you're trying to negotiate a business contract. So sometimes people have access to things and aren't really comfortable with them. If you're an entrepreneur who is selling on a platform that you know, helps you build a digital storefront, then that then some things will be solved for you, but you're using the internet in a more sophisticated way. If you've got your own platform for your own firm and you want to provide your customers with a high quality user experience and user interface, then you may be operating at a level of sophistication where you actually hire a web designer that works with you to do something that optimizes something for your business. And your web designer may be working with you on the higher level skills, but then have a back office of coding that they send out to India or somewhere. So there's all, all different places that one can come in with these skill sets. One of the things that um, I thought was surprising and very interesting is that um, Africa is like ranks higher than any of the other regions of the world in total early stage entrepreneurship. Um, what does that mean? If you actually um, count up the number of people who are involved in a startup and figure the share of the working age population that do that, it's higher here than anywhere else. And there are more startups all the time, so many that we cannot really um, keep track of them all. Um, but this is, we want to work on entrepreneurial skills. One of the goals of the African Union, uh, which has been discussed in some of the earlier sessions at this conference, is to have a single digital market. And this has been, in, in some sense, I think, inspired by some of what the EU has done. Um, and this has several levels, a level of connectivity so that things are physically connected all over the continent. Uh, you have multiple redundancy um, because if something breaks, then, then, then you have a problem if you don't have that physical connectivity. Um, that single data that you can move you know, data all around the continent and not, you know, and, and, and have access to the cloud and then an online market where if you're doing e-commerce, you can do it across the continent. I, I heard somebody mention in one of the earlier sessions that they would love to have this all free inside Africa, but then protect it from the rest of the world. And I wanted to challenge that because I think it, that not only has, you know, is problematic in terms of how the internet physically works, but in terms of what you want to use it for. You want to be able to draw information in from the world. You want to use it to export. You want to use it to participate in global value chains, which are buying and selling. So I would think of this as being an open network. We want to have metrics for how well we are doing in this digital moonshot. Um, how many people are attached? How, much, how many new um, startups do we have? Um, you know, how far is financial access um, progressing? And so we you know, want to keep track of these. Um, what, are, what, what are we talking about in terms of the amount of resources? For the World Bank Group specifically, we're talking about committing $5 billion over the next several years to the digital moonshot. And where we have yeah, partnership and opportunity with individual countries um, and where you know, we also have you know, the active engagement of our country management units in the World Bank. Um, we will be working on these activities, both the hard infrastructure and the softer things in a number of countries. This graphic shows you some of the places 
will be working in first, but actually discussions are going on with, you know, I'd say a couple of dozen countries at the moment, and we'll actually be leveraging all the instruments that the World Bank Group has to do this, not only all of the financial instruments, the, um, the DPOs, the IPFs, program for results, whatnot, but every type of advisory services, all the knowledge products that we can leverage to, to do this. There not only won't be an instrument that we won't be using, but the partnership across the various units of the World Bank is going to be extensive. And in fact, as an example of this, this is the leadership of this is in our digital development unit, which is the infrastructure people. I'm in the macroeconomics trade and investment unit. So I'm actually an international trade guy, okay? And yet we have enough trust across the units of the bank that they allow me to present their slides. And we have people in the agriculture unit, in the health and education, all the ways in which this technology can be applied. And yeah, the point of providing some capital is to encourage others to do the same. This is gonna re require a combination of multilateral, regional, um, individual African governments, private capital, and so, you know, we've already you know, mentioned um, the African Union, but actually um, there are a large number of, you know, public, private, and NGO partners involved with this. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And uh, as I said, the, uh, the presentations will be available on, on the website, uh, as well as, of course, the, uh, the archive of this session. So you can look at those later. But uh, let me also thank uh, World Bank for partnering with uh, ITU and the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure uh, in a collaboration that's uh, supported by the bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we call it Financial um, Inclusion Global Initiative. And that uh, is developing standards for, uh, in the area of uh, digital financial services for uh, security, uh, privacy, and uh, consumer protection, interoperability. That um, the next meeting of Fiji will be in uh, Cairo on the 22nd to 24th of January, and uh, it's open to all interested stakeholders to participate in that group free of charge. So uh, I would um, invite you to uh, join that initiative. So now we, we uh, move down the line to um, uh, a uh, presentation from our industry member. So we have uh, Nivi Sharma, the CEO of uh, BRCK. Uh, Nivi, over to you. Thank you very much. My name's uh, Nivi, and I'm the CEO of BRIC. I'd, I'm quite lucky to have had um, speakers like Dr. Gilwald speak before me and do the hard work and heavy lifting of the rigorous research and the data that backs what I'm about to say. So we're a private sector Kenyan company dealing with connectivity. And I guess my job on this panel is now to really bring to the ground um, our challenges, our approach to connecting people to the internet. And that's really our mission at BRIC. Our mission is to connect Africa to the internet. And <clears throat> I guess if you've ever heard us speak or anyone from BRIC speak at a, on a panel before, what we say often is that you cannot have a functioning or a thriving 21st century economy without power and connectivity. And our job is really focused on the connectivity part of that. And the way we do that is, uh, is to tackle two main problems of the connectivity issue. One is access, and the other is affordability. The access we tackle with our hardware. So we've engineered and developed uh, technology in Kenya for Kenya. <clears throat> noticing that a lot of the technology we're using in, in Africa in general has been designed, engineered, 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, developed somewhere else in the West, in the East, for and by someone else. So we started out as a hardware company saying, how do we build hardware that's suitable to the infrastructure realities on the ground here? And since then, we've really transformed and said, well, how do we take this hardware and connect people to the internet with it? Um, and I don't need to go into the benefits of connecting people to the internet. We have, um, I guess, those pillars of development from agriculture, ag tech, fintech, e-learning, e-commerce, healthcare, and so on. Those are all pillars on which, you know, edu uh, connectivity is a foundation. It's a foundational building block. So we're really focused on bringing that to the continent. Uh, so as I said, our engineering is right from is a full stack engineering, right from hardware, firmware, software, um, right to end user development. So we take the backhaul connectivity, the the large infrastructure infrastructure projects, and we provide that last mile ground game. And we've done that in ways. Um, we've got about 1,000 buses and matatus in Nairobi and Kigali connecting people to a free-to-consumer Wi-Fi internet, and now we're also moving to rural areas. The other part of the problem, and I've always thought that connectivity in Africa is not a, is not a technology problem. We've solved that problem. We can technically bring connectivity everywhere. It's a business model problem. So the other part, uh, the other side of our coin is tackling the affordability problem by our innovative business model. And that is a underlying economy that's built on a digital economy where businesses create engagement tasks online and users can complete them to earn value. And they earn value to spend value within that system by getting online, accessing foster, uh, foster connectivity, accessing premium content, and so on. And, you know, it's nice once in a while, while to be validated by you know, Time magazine saying that we're one of the top 50 genius companies in the world this year because we've cracked that problem. And we're thinking about it in a way that the incumbents uh, in the space are not thinking about it. We don't, we're not thinking that as an end user, you've got to reach into your pocket, take money out, buy a scratch card, um, load credit into your phone, and then you're able to get online. And if we're able to do that, then, we, then we're not confined to urban areas. When we look at that last, last mile of um, a small community in Daraja, Laikipia, there is a population of less than 2,000 people there. So why put up a tower there? There's no return on investment. Those people, those users, don't matter. They don't matter to the incumbents, to the large mobile network operators, and certainly not to the ISPs. So how do we create that return on, invent, uh, uh, on investment? And that's where our business model really kicks in. And it's not just brick. There are so many innovative companies that are functioning at this last mile stage and are thinking up new innovative business models, thinking up innovative technology that works. So now we're able to go into a rural area, um, not hindered and not held back by the legacy technology, and it really is aged technology that the incumbents are using, and not, um, and not hindered by the legacy business models that they're using. So we go, we're able to go in, um, build a tower at 10% of the cost that um, a mobile network operator would have to do. Uh, you know, we're not investing in GSM. GSM is really a dead man walking. It's a data-only network. So, you know, no phone calls, no SMSs. What do populations do when they're online, when they're purely online? And that's an, that's an interesting question to, to start thinking about. Um, and so when we, when we enter those communities, the things we see, so right now we've got uh, about half a million unique monthly users on our platform. And these are people who, again, instead of being able to reach into their pocket and pay for connectivity, they're able to pay with their time, their attention, their engagement in digital tasks. And that's a really valuable way of businesses to digitally engage with, um, with the people that they want to reach. So one of the largest banks in Kenya, their you know, mobile banking application or their mobile banking customers, 85% of those mobile banking customers are still only using USSD. The savings to them, if all of those customers, let alone all of their customers in general, were to use their online banking app, um, that would be huge. But the biggest barrier to those customers is that, is again, reaching into their pockets, spending, 10%, 25%, um, 50% of their daily 
uh, income on getting online, watching a YouTube ad or downloading an application or even up, uh, updating that application. And that's too, much of, um, that's too much of a financial burden to place on the consumer. So the entire model is now, let's, you know, let's take the consumer's pockets out of, the, out of the equation and really think creatively and innovatively about how to do that. So we've had a great success with that. We've seen, we haven't spoken much on this panel about the impact and I'm not a researcher, and can't, and, but I'm sure at some stage during this conference, you've heard about the impact of connectivity. Um, just anecdotally, our users, this farmers who are learning about herbicides they can use to uh, take care of the pests on their tomatoes. There are learners who are doing online courses. There are um, men who are you know, tackling um, or fathers who are joining forums uh, because their children have, have anything like asthma and how to deal and alleviate their, um, their issues. We're also seeing a real strengthening of civil society and an accountability to government. And that's a little harder to capture, but we're, you know, we're interested in, in traveling down that road and seeing it. Um, I have to say at this juncture that it's not all rosy out of the top... 10 sites that are visited um, online, we know that five of them are pornography and mobile betting sites. So we can't just provide a digital economy, we can't just provide connectivity and said we've built it and they will come and they will thrive, but we've got to, we've got, that has to go hand in hand with digital literacy and teaching people that, hey, you're connected to the largest, greatest network of knowledge and information in the world, what are you going to do with that resource? And Perhaps the people in this room, we don't think about it because our data connectivity, us being online, that is ubiquitous and it is perpetual. We don't think of sending a WhatsApp message, um, switching our data on and switching it off as soon as that WhatsApp message has gone through. Um, it's, as I said, ubiquitous and perpetual to us. So when we put ourselves in the shoes of people who are really trying to balance a checkbook and try to choose what they do online, it's hard to think about... Um, it's hard to think about what kind of digital literacy can be presented to them in a way that isn't paternalistic, um, but really does open opportunities and potentials for them. So that's a challenge that isn't core to our business, but we're thinking about it uh, in terms of our digital responsibility and really actively looking for partners to help us unlock uh, the delivery of this training and the delivery of the internet to people who have never been connected before. Um, on the ground, as a business, <clears throat> our challenges, the hurdles that we face, like I said, there's several innovative private sector organizations that, is, that are tackling the connectivity problem with technology, we're tackling it with innovative business models, but the truth is that we're being strangled by political and regulatory hurdles. And I'll say that again, they're both political and the regulatory hurdles that we have to jump through. So the tip of the spear for us was unlicensed spectrum in the Wi-Fi space. That was an easy way to get through. But now if we're trying to go into rural areas and provide free 4G connectivity to um, a community in Kajiado or Laikipia, then to get spectrum, to be allocated spectrum that isn't um, you know, a ridiculous spectrum like 2.5 megahertz that has hardly any phone support in the country is almost impossible to do. And so we might be going through the motions and speaking as a government or at a policy level about not um, about being open, about not having monopolies in the, uh, in the telecom sector, but the truth is that um, the large corporates, the large incumbents, are really are, um, do have a stranglehold on the ability for uh, innovative young companies to, to rise up and show last mile connectivity solutions. And the ironic part is that we're showing these solutions in places that they're not even interested in, in serving. So when, when I think about what those incumbents are, um, at one stage, these were really innovative companies. The, the mobile network operators of Africa were the people who were saying, hey, how about we try prepaid credit? What if we take the, the credit that people have in their phone and give people the ability to change that into cash, which is now our mobile banking or mobile money? Um, <clears throat> and they were, you know, such cowboys and renegades, as we call them, back in the day. But now the reins have been handed over to fat cat barons who are sitting um, on these paychecks and not letting anyone else shake up their business model. Um, we want people to reach into their pocket, 
take money out, buy a scratch card, um, and that goes into our pockets. There's no other business model that would, um, that's being allowed to come in and really shake up the, the entire industry. So it's, um, we're hopeful in that we're, you know, we've been given, in Kenya at least, uh, some wiggle room to, to look at um, things like TV white space, um, spectrum, like very edge spectrum, to try out our business model and our technology sp stack. But I know that throughout Africa, um, that is a, a big hurdle for, for innovation to solve the problem of last mile connectivity. I don't think it'll be solved by the incumbent large players in the market. It'll have to be solved by small, nimble organizations that um, are able to think about that. So I'll leave you with that, but um, again, one of the main messages that um, I'd like to think about as we tackle the problem of last mile connectivity is the problem of digital literacy and providing that, the skills and the tools in one's toolkit as they're, as they're grappling with the, the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nivi, and congratulations on what you've uh, achieved. Um, certainly bringing the benefits of connectivity to uh, people living in the villages and rural areas is really uh, the big challenge. And uh, as you've said, Without that connectivity, uh, we will never achieve the sustainable development goals. So there's a lot more to be gained than just uh, uh, access to e-commerce. Right, so uh, moving on to uh, Nicholas Williams. He's the head of ICT division in the African Bank. Uh, over to you, Nicholas. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, good morning. A big good morning to all the Kenyans who have managed to make it here on Jamuri Day. Congratulations on 54 years as a republic. Um, it's lovely to, that, that people have come down today to, to, to uh, hear about connectivity and, and, and how, how we might resolve some of the, the issues affecting Africa. And I think, you know, just reflecting on you know, the benefit of go, going sec second last here is you can reflect a, a bit on what others have said. I think there, what we've heard from, from Alice, Alison Benoit and Michael is a kind of commonality of, of view on the framework to think about um, ICT and ICT coverage and some of the problems. Um, I think um, uh, what we're seeing is that it's a holistic problem. It's not one where you just dive straight into the supply side and, and think that's, that's a solution. And then we hear Nivi, who's actually got her hands dirty. We, development bankers don't get their hands dirty. We leave it for others um, who actually got their hands dirty and actually understand what's happening at the coal face and, and, and bring, bring innovation to, to markets and illustrate that there's still contestable markets out there. And I wanted to reflect really, and I won't take too long because m many other people have spoken already, reflect on a point that Nivi made, and it's a point that I think is central here, which is the issues of coverage and the issues of connectivity and accessibility, they're not finance problems, they're not an investment gap, they're a business, business case problem, they're a business case gap. And what we need to do is, is look at the business case and why someone would bother investing. And I think, you know, we, we tend to rush in and we talk about the supply side and, you know, we're, banks such as ours are guilty of doing so because we like to invest in infrastructure. But I think with, with ICT, a lot of the issues in Africa are built around the demand side. We need to build, create the demand pool for services because there isn't, a fundamental investment gap. If people can see the investment opportunity, they see the business opportunity, the money will flow. The big players have access to cash, that we've got other guys coming in, we've got companies like Brick who raise money. Where there's a business case that's understandable, people will push cash. It's not like some of the other infrastructure um, areas where, where there is a paucity of money. Um, people are willing to invest, but we need to just show them that there's a strong demand side here. And I think that's where, where the governments particularly have been a bit, I would argue, slow in responding. They're getting the message now, which is they need to do things like national, you know, digital identity. World Bank's had a big program on digital identity. Why? Because off the back of that, once I know who someone is, 
I can actually start offering us uh, uh, useful services. We always start then with the financial services, digital financial inclusion. If I get that, now I can monetize services. I can monetize services, but I can also transfer, transfer money uh, more readily to people, for example, in rural areas. Currently, to my mind, and I will we'll talk to Nivi afterwards to check this, my view is that there isn't a strong demand pull from the rural areas because there isn't a, an actual understanding of the value of connectivity at the moment. If I have a digital ID coupled with digital financial services, now I'm in a rural area, I can transact, I can receive uh, subsidy payments, you know, fertilizer subsidies for like. I want to be, I've, I actually want to be um, uh, connected. So the issue around, for example, as Alison illustrated, I think the device the device cost being a barrier. Now I'm incentivized to get over that. I'm going to try and get myself a device. I'm going to try and get connected because I, there's some value, there's a value proposition to me to being connected. So we, we in the, uh, the, the bank have been pushing, for example, um, similar things, ID, financial services, but we also need to see um, governments getting online, government, e-government, Government is the biggest economic player in the market. If it's not using digital, why is anyone else going to be? It can lead, it can, it can um, provide, it can improve service delivery all across Africa if it goes online and we have uh, substantial e-government infrastructure, substantial really e-government services rather than infrastructure. The infrastructure um, isn't an issue where you've got private sector investment. Um, the e-government services will create the, uh, the, the demand pull again for, 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 for infrastructure. They build up, if you like, the, the revenue piece on the, uh, on the business case. That's the, 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 uh, the top line here. And um, I was trying to think it was the numerator or the denominator, but anyway, it's the numerator. Um, so we need to, to encourage e-government e adoption. We need to encourage the adoption of digital um, uh, technologies within, uh, for example, the power companies, smart power, smart water, smart this and that, so that we could create an environment in which Africans are, are working, they're used to working with technology, they've got that <laughs> culture of technology adoption. Uh, and service adoption that then creates the demand pull. Now that doesn't say, mean that we're all rosy and that's all we need to do and the supply side isn't a problem. The supply side's expensive in Africa, um, and if only because often power is, a, is expensive. Um, but we need to uh, then be a bit more clever on the supply side. So get, look at the demand side, but get clever on the supply side. For example, we have universal service funds. It's not clear to me why we bother, because we haven't really been using them sufficiently in Africa. But if we're collecting that money, and we've got a supply side problem now, why aren't we just capitalizing all our future revenue flows into the fund now? We can pay down the debt that, 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 that's taken on board by the future revenues from into the Universal Service Fund. But if we've got a fundamental gap now, why don't we just capitalize future investment for flows into the USF? The governments also, I think, need to um, leverage assets uh, substantially better than, than they have. We, we see, uh, and we, we're guilty of this, we, we finance governments to put in place, for example, fiber assets. And we've done it and kind of, we've known that it is a suboptimal model for the government to be, to be doing it, but they were, at, they were prepared to take financing and we need to crack on with the fiber deployment so there was a, a, an economic benefit to catalyzing uh, uh, the, the fiber market by just putting the investment in now. What we need to see is for that fiber investment and some of these other investments that the governments are holding now to be reallocated into the private sector somehow so that they're more efficiently managed. It might be, might be things like uh, OPGW, so uh, uh, fiber over power lines that's held by the state company might be fiber assets that, that they've they've put in terrestrial fiber assets held by a publicly owned telco but often these assets are, are, are aren't effectively used um, they don't but by the government and we need to start dragging some of that out and what I think you'll see 
if you're sitting in government and talking to the likes of us, and I think the World Bank and the IFC coming out the door, is a much greater discussion about how do we release existing assets in Africa so that we're getting more value from them before we even consider how we invest in new assets. Um, we need to create incentives for people to get online. So why are we taxing devices? That's bizarre to me why we tax devices. We see connectivity as a human right on the one hand. Governments say it, they see it as a human right. And then they're taxing stuff. So they're creating a barrier to, to, to uh, inclusion. And that's particularly acute on the devices side. I think there was some study some, some while back um, done for the GSMA which illustrated the price elasticity on device. You know, it's a price elasticity, elastic market. Once you're on, you tend to be price inelastic. Your continued access, uh, consumption tends to be price inelastic. But getting people on in the first place is the, the problem. And we, we, an illustration of, of the, the fact that subsequently there isn't a, this price elasticity problem was this point that people are prepared to pay for more for quality. They're prepared to push once they're on, push money into connectivity and services. So why are we taxing, for example, devices? What other things can the government do to, to, to um, uh, incentivize the private sector to deploy, deploy assets? There's issues about being much cleverer spectrum management, you know, push the spectrum out early, as Malcolm was saying, the release the spectrum for the digital divi dividend on time. You know, all of these things are us shooting ourselves in the foot that we haven't done them. And it, it's regrettable, because it's in our control is that in Africa to get them right. Um, we can simplify, you know, access to way leaves. We can, we can, should look at federal, federal rather than local rules on, 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 on deployment and, and telecoms build because that's often a barrier. Certainly on the taxation of fiber and, and ducts, it sometimes it's just ridiculous. Metro fiber is blooming difficult to deploy in Africa. And it's not that the, the demand isn't there fundamentally. The cost base is too high. And it, yet it's in our control. Um, so there's the supply side. There's the demand side. Let's throw more money. <laughs> And, and on the demand side, I'd miss one point that I would say is we need to throw more money at innovation and skills. And I think that's been a common thing down the line. It can be digital literacy, so people can use things, but it's also computational skills, the coding for employment type things. Um, the bank, uh, we as a bank have a target to, to educate 234,000 coders by 2026, for example. But also get into the computational skills development that allows the, the Africa to to participate in the creation of algorithms and, and do artificial intelligence and use the data sets that it, it, it's now accumulating. Um, so we got demand side, we got the supply side, we got the regulatory piece. I, I don't think Africa is too bad on regulation. We, 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 sh we, we complain, complain a lot. I think that, the, the, you know, I think the EU has, has had significant amounts of regulation. Um, does Africa want to copy the EU model? I'm not, not so sure. I'm not sure that we're technically able to do so, nor that it, whether it's fit, fit for purpose in Africa. I think we just need to go through what it is that we're trying to uh, achieve with regulation before we worry about whether the specific regulations are, are, are nice or not. And I think there, I think we, we need to think, well, if our problem is getting infrastructure to, into the ground, it's probably not necessarily a competition issue. People are prepared to pay for access once they've got it. It seems to be regulate for investment point. Let's get people actually in a position that they can invest. So that takes us back to this early release of spectrum. Some of the issues you, you were talking about, maybe about the right spectrum for, for entrepreneurs to come in to address markets. It's about you know what the pricing of spectrum. Um, it's, but the key for me is let's look through the lens of we're trying to incentivize investment rather than we're trying to incentivize competition. I think that's a stronger need at the moment in Africa. Um, if we go through all of that, we end up, I hope, uncovering the real, real infrastructure gap here. 
as a bank, we fully support what the World Bank has laid out in the, their moonshot. And I think that same moonshot will be captured again in the EU discussions in Vienna on Monday and Tuesday. I think what we see is a commonality of approach from investors like ourselves, the EU, the, the, the World Bank. We just need to crack on with the, with the, the, the process now and, and actually get down into, well, the specifics of what we're going to do. Um, but for me, that, I've waffled on at length, and you know, it's, it is Jamuri Day, and people deserve better than me. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. And if you've got <clears throat> any um, of your waffling uh, written down, we'd be grateful for it. We can put it onto the, uh, the session website. <clears throat> um, made some very good points, especially about uh, better use of the Universal Service Fund. Um, that was uh, uh, also point brought up at the uh, breakfast meeting of the WEF uh, this morning. And, uh, and the availability of spectrum. As I mentioned, um, Africa actually signed up to switching over from analog to digital TV at a conference in ITU in 2006 to switch over by 2015, but so far only four African countries have switched over. So there's a lot of unused spectrum that could be uh, better used um, to satisfy some of these, these needs. So um, moving to the last but not least uh, speaker, uh, Michiku uh, Mwangi is the um, Development Manager for Africa for Internet uh, Development and um, from the Internet Society. So over to you, Michiko. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, being the last means that uh, a lot of the stuff you would like to say has been said. But uh, I'll probably like to start um, with uh, some, some taking you back to some of the important aspects that uh, you know, make the Internet what it is. Um, some of you know that uh, the Internet Society is, provides the institutional home to the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, we, which is where some of the Internet standards are made. And part of the uh, mantra of operating is uh, uh, to achieve a, a standard is through rough consensus and running code. Uh, rough consensus and running code. So maybe I will start by asking if you're still awake, could you please hum? Because th the way they achieve rough consensus is by humming. So if you're still awake, could you please hum? Mm. I'm sure if you're not awake, there's no point of asking you to hum because you're asleep. Um, but uh, so one of the things that will be of interest to you is to try and identify with the IETF. Uh, there is a document that was written, um, I think around 1996, which tries to uh, outline uh, what is the architecture, uh, architectural principle of the internet. And uh, those, uh, uh, an RFC that was, or a request for comment document that was uh, drafted uh, around that time trying to sort of outline this uh, architectural funding principles of the internet which are important to its continued evolution and existence. And uh, it basically uh, highlights that the internet is an end-to-end -end concept, meaning that the, the reason why the internet works the way it is, it was founded on the principle of the end-to-end, -end, um, uh, meaning that uh, with that end-to-end -end architecture, it is possible for you to have interoperability because um, you're able to connect devices regardless of the hardware that exists on both ends, you're able to communicate through the, the entire network. And so uh, certain other aspects were built into it, like um, you know, making sure that it's open, uh, it's interoperable, it's scalable, um, there's only one protocol that is used and so on. And this leads on to basically creating what the internet is, which is a connection of diverse networks. And those diverse networks ensure that because uh, by the architecture being end to end, it means that the power lies on the edge and in the middle there is really nothing uh, that, that exists. And 
that allows us to actually build a lot of things onto the internet and make it uh, you know, as interesting, as, as unique, as innovative as it is today in terms of what we've been able to realize over the years. And in other words, you look at it as a, a platform that has allowed us to have permissionless innovation because if everything lies on the edge, uh, it means the innovation lies with the people that are on the edge of the network. Um, as opposed to the core, um, which you know um, w would make it difficult because you'll need permission to be able to be creative and put something on the core of the network. Whereas on the internet, everything lies on the edge of it. The power of it lies on the edge. So why is this important? And why am I taking a moment to go back to this really important principle, architectural principle of the internet? Well, when we look at infrastructure, uh, the discussions we have is about connecting, uh, providing this, the, the physical layer of the access and letting people be able to get onto it and be creative and innovative about how they want uh, to, to go about their way of life. And that's where the impact really lies, that once you have access to this infrastructure, uh, you're able to do more. Uh, you're able to come on board and, you know, and try something uh, may be successful, sometimes it's not always successful, but there's an opportunity for you to have a playing ground where you can try new innovative things. And, and you know, e-commerce runs on this platform and many other technologies and services that continue to run on this internet platform. So what seems to be happening is that we've been building this uh, infrastructure uh, through the, income, uh, the existing models, the business models, which have been previously discussed. Um, uh, and these traditional solutions are showing some signs of having reached their limits. Um, I remember looking at a GSMA paper which shows that uh, for a mobile operator to deploy a 3G base station, they require a minimum of, of at least 3,000 active uh, subscribers. Now, if you look at some of these uh, areas where you have the rural communities, um, as um, Nivi had mentioned earlier, you know, they, they may not have those numbers. And so what does it mean for deploying the traditional solutions that exist for connectivity? It means it's very difficult to use those traditional solutions. So there's, we've almost reached that point where we need to look at alternative uh, or complementary solutions to get more people connected. And, uh, you know, because it's the only way we can be able to get majority of the remaining people, uh, at least in Africa, to be online. I was looking at some research uh, by, uh, I think it's Hamilton, where, which is showing that uh, at present, uh, f about 50%, percent, 54% of Africa lives within uh, 25 kilometers to a fiber node. And then there's the other 50% which lives way, uh, way beyond that. But 25 kilometers to a fiber node means you're just, just far enough, not, enough uh, not close enough to have access uh, to that infrastructure uh, or to benefit from that fiber that is there. So the question is how do we get 50% of the, uh, at least uh, slightly less than 50% of the African population connected to this infrastructure so that they can also try their uh, to, to compete, uh, you know, benefit uh, from, uh, from this infrastructure the way others in urban centers have been and reduce this gap that keeps growing over and over. So I would like to uh, talk about community networks uh, as an alternative and complementary approach to connecting the unconnected. And um, I will start off by uh, sharing an experience we had this September when we went to a place in Eastern Cape, um, uh, towards the very edge of the Eastern Cape in a, a town called Lubanzi, uh, Eastern Cape of South Africa. Um, and uh, we held the third community network summit um, in this place where it's quite rural. Uh, the only uh, hotel we could find was a backpacker's lodge. And so we tried to cram about 100 people in Backpackers Lodge, in a Backpackers Lodge, which was quite uncomfortable for some people, but I, th I thought it was quite fun. Um, the experience we had was that, you know, the first day was great. We had connectivity, and connectivity was provided by Zenzeleni community networks, but there was also 3G coverage. And on the second day or the second night, there was um, a heavy storm quite a heavy storm that took out um, all the mobile 3G services that were available in that area. And it took about 15 hours before the mobile signal came back. 
But during this time, uh, the conference went on. Uh, we had connectivity. We had about 40 megabits per second through the Nzeleni. And that was still operational. And uh, the question we had to ourselves is, why is it that a mobile network that is built based on very modern standards, and it has to be, you know, it has to meet the regulatory requirements to actually operate and put those base stations, is unable to provide service through and through, while a community network, which is built by the engineers and folks with, uh, that have been trained in Zenzeleni, the locals, is able to provide service during this period where there is, you know, um, natural weather occurrence, which is a storm, and function pretty well. It doesn't depend on power because it uses solar. Um, it's using very cheap uh, wireless equipment uh, that you can buy from the shelf at the local store, and gives decent connectivity to a conference of about 100 people uh, for the f six days that we were in, in, in the Lubanzi area. So why, uh, why is it that there is such insistence that you know, we have to abide or build these networks that are very expensive to build, as you know, Nivi has mentioned, but they are unable to sustain operating in those environments that are quite difficult, even for them to return an investment on, on, on those services. So, looking at community networks in general is that uh, there is an opportunity here for them and uh, I would like to start off by uh, addressing a couple of issues which I think are important. First, from a regulatory point of view, um, we need to review how we license uh, or we create licensing for these kind of areas. Um, if we don't, um, I, and I'll quote one of my colleagues, uh, Carlos Ray Moreno from APC, he says, if we don't demand for structural engineering uh, diagrams for rural homes, the thatched ones, why are we demanding that the networks that are being built there meet the same standards as an urban, uh, you know, struck, uh, an urban designed uh, network? Because the house in the rural village is built by the local people who actually understand how to build and thatch the house. No structural drawings need approval, etc. Um, and if they can build a network in that kind of environment, it's going to be built using the local uh, resources that are available there, which makes it sustainable. If you have to import equipment and a base station and expertise to run and maintain a network in that area where everybody's living in a thatched house, then automatically you've priced yourself out of providing a sustainable service. Um, if I could show a photo of what they're using there, it's, it's a sub $100 uh, uh, wireless radio that is put on top of the thatched roof and just works. There's not much to it and doesn't require approvals and so much more uh, behind that to provide this uh, basic you know, uh, physical in uh, connectivity that is needed. Um, the other issue is spectrum. I think Nivi has touched on that uh, uh, quite well and there's a lot more to, to discuss about the issue of spectrum. There's a lot of idle spectrum that has been allocated um, that is not in use in these uh, rural areas. So uh, we need to actually find uh, secondary use cases where if the spectrum sitting idle in, in a rural areas, can it be reused uh, by, by you know, uh, op organizations that are operating there? Um, and it, we've seen this happening in Mexico with, with, with a certain level of success. Um, then the second thing I also want to touch with respect to community next works is how we fund them and how we uh, uh, make them sustainable. Now, interestingly, there's been a mention about Universal Service Fund, and um, we, we had a meeting recently in, with, with a regulator, and we tr tried to see how they are actually implementing Universal Service Fund. And we were quite surprised at the costs that was being put towards rolling out a single base station from the Universal Service Fund it is quite high. We could build a huge community network with just the cost of one base station. And, and this to me is an alternative approach where, and, and we've had cases where uh, mobile operators are told that, look, there's universal service fund, we'd like you to go and build here, and we can use it for CAPEX. But the operators want 
uh, the, the funding uh, to be support, uh, the Universal Service Fund to be used to support OPEX as well, not just CAPEX, but because they can see there is no uh, real returns from, the, uh, from those areas that are being asked to, to go and build. So some of them are fr uh, outrightly declining to go and build, despite being given the CAPEX to go and build in some of these areas. So we know that model is not working. Can we try something else? Another thing that to think about with respect to funding and, and, and sustainability of community networks, the, the approaches that we've used have generally been uh, what we call extractive business models. When a mobile network uh, an operator goes and deploys in this rural village, it puts a base station and sits somewhere and waits for the users to buy scratch cards, but there's never a single investment that goes back into that particular community. But if you reverse that and say, well, let's look at the different business model. What if the people in that village owned the network? Meaning that uh, if they're charging for this service, a significant portion of the revenue collected for, by providing this service actually stays in the community and only a small amount that goes into buying either uh, connectivity, extending the connectivity out of the uh, rural village to the next city where they can buy cheaper uh, access is, is, is built into the model, then it means that they are richer for connecting you know, as opposed to being poorer for communicating with each other because a certain percentage of the revenue will stay uh, in, in, um, in, in the community. And we've seen this, a good case being Zenzeleni once again, where as a result of running the network, uh, 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 revenues that they are collecting staying within the community, they've, they've actually built surplus uh, operating surplus, and now what they are using that operating surplus for is to provide micro loans to people in the village who often don't qualify for uh, any uh, banking loans uh, or, or, or from formal institutions like the banks and so on. Um, the last, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about, uh, sorry, is uh, taxation. Uh, I think this has been uh, spoken to quite extensively by the previous speakers, but um, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll give a very uh, simple example. We're, we're building a community network, um, and I'm actively involved in that in um, uh, in a city about 400 kilometers from Harare called Murambinda, and uh, trying to buy equipment in Zimbabwe. Uh, we're finding that the tax cost the the, 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 the level of taxation on the equipment is so high um, that it's probably cheaper for me to buy the equipment in, you know, online on Amazon, put it in my bag and try and fly in. But of course, I, I don't want to do that because it will be against the, you know, the... Uh, the, the, the laws, so I'll, if you have to declare it, then the taxes go much higher, up to 40%, which makes it very difficult for you to build these alternative solutions um, of, of connecting people in rural areas. And so they are the mercy, really, of uh, the traditional mod, uh, method, methods of connecting people. So taxation will be a big hindrance on how we connect uh, the unconnected, and unless we address that issue and lower the cost, then, uh, of, or rather reduce the taxes or eliminated them altogether, then uh, it will be a challenge. Uh, finally, um, I, I want to talk about access to the existing infrastructure. Quite a number of um, countries have actually rolled out terrestrial infrastructure, fiber infrastructure, at uh, using you know the national uh, funds or uh, public funds. Uh, uh, you know, reaching quite, you know, uh, covering quite uh, significant uh, um, areas uh, or, or coverage uh, in, in many countries in Africa. But then the, what we've come to learn is that a lot of that fiber sits idle because it's there, um, you know, part, forms part of this, uh, you know, uh, data that's showing that more than 50% of Africa is close to, uh, uh, within 25 kilometers, close to a fiber, active fiber node. But a lot of that is sitting idle. So if there is no business model to, to, to extend it to the next or to get more people connected, then why don't we look at alternative models like community networks having access to this fiber so that they can provide uh, connectivity to the people in these underserved communities. So um, with that, I would sort of like to, uh, to, to sort of conclude there, but as I stop, uh, I just want to respond to one of the questions that I think Nicholas had asked with respect to uh, the, the, the ways the demand in the, 
in the rural areas. They're not seeing the demand. But I'll say, actually, it's understanding the, 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 the rural areas set up and identifying what the anchor uh, points are. Uh, so in Zimbabwe, for instance, in Burambinda, we've identified that the anchor places are the schools. Um, and the schools are very keen to have connectivity because a lot of the curriculums have all gone, uh, have all introduced uh, e-learning. And unfortunately, the schools in the rural areas will not be able to compete at the same level with schools in urban centers because they don't have access to connectivity. But they are trying. They're building labs. They're going to parents and asking them to contribute to build a lab. But they don't have access. And when they go to the operators and ask them, could you please uh, provide us with connectivity, the operator says, why would I go 50 kilometers just to connect three schools? It, it doesn't make business case, uh, business sense to them. So. The community networks actually is coming in in Murambinda to actually serve uh, as, as sort of like uh, address this particular gap and connect, connecting uh, initially targeting the schools, uh, health facilities and government agency, uh, government, local government authority offices that are in that area. And the moment we call for a meeting just to find out what their interests are, we found schools heads coming from 150 kilometers from Murambinda and asking when will I get connected? because the district is wide and they are looking for connectivity. So if you're able to understand what the economic um, anchor uh, institutions will be to build such a network, then it makes a business case for the community networks to start. They're using low cost equipment to build, uh, uh, you know, renewable uh, power using solar to, as a way of getting more, um, uh, or being able to cover more of the footprint even where there is no power. And the schools are also prepared. They have labs. They've looked at alternative ways to power the labs using um, uh, Raspberry Pis and those kind of things to get connect, uh, to, to, to build their labs for, this, uh, for the students to, to have some form of computing resources that they can use to, 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 uh, to study. So um, basically, I, I think there's, there's, a business, there's a case, and not just a business case, but there's a case for community networks as a way, as an alternative way for getting uh, access to the rural and unconnected communities, and something we could uh, certainly explore uh, with you know, various partners and organizations uh, to try and get them more um, established in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michuki, uh, for that uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, it reminded me of uh, a previous visit I made to Kenya, where I was invited to, to visit this um, school in a little village. I got the name, it was Ulusurutio, this tiny little village out in the rural areas uh, where the, um, the satellite company, Avanti, was providing a downlink for um, e-learning to the school. Uh, and then they provided a, a Wi-Fi coverage for, for the campus, but it also covered the village. So people in the village could also take advantage of the Wi-Fi and the satellite link. Um, so the, the company was getting some revenue for the people in the village using you know, uh, the, the Wi-Fi connection, but the school was getting it free of charge. And, it was uh, wonderful to see, you know, the enthusiasm of the of the pupils um, to use these uh, big, large screens in their classroom to get all this information and knowledge from around the world uh, into the classroom. There, so much excitement, and also from the teachers. Uh, you know, when you see something like that, it makes all this discussion worthwhile. <laughs> So, um, yeah, thanks also for a uh, very good uh, collaboration between ITU and Internet Society. Internet Society is a member of uh, ITU, and we work very closely with the um, IETF on the standards. Clearly, there has to be very close uh, collaboration between ITU's work on the telecom network standards and broadband standards and uh, IETF's work on the, on the Internet standards. So, thanks for that. So uh, I'm sure you agree with me. We had tremendously interesting and uh, informative uh, presentations from all the panelists. Um, thank you for staying with us. And uh, even though the level of humming wasn't very, very high, I think everybody is uh, fully awake and, and following all this. 
think it, you have to go to a few internet meetings to get, you know, to get your level of humming up to the right level. So, um, okay, so uh, opening the floor for uh, questions, and uh, nice to see quite a few. There's one straight in front of me. Um, if you give your name and affiliation and, and uh, direct a question to one of the panelists. Okay, uh, go, go there first. One. Good morning, everybody. Uh, excuse me, please. I will uh, speak uh, in French. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning to all. Good morning to your panelists. My name is Resta Win. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm president of the Cameroonese Federation of E-Commerce. I'm the president of the Foundation for the Promotion of E-Commerce in Africa. And I have a few questions to the representatives of the banks who are on the panel. I would like to know which mechanisms your banks are setting up to finance development projects in the field of e-commerce in Africa. I'm referring here to projects such as the creation of enterprises specializing in e-commerce. I'm also here referring to projects in the field of research, research looking at trends and the evolution of the sector. And finally, projects in the field of the development of competencies. We at the Foundation for E-commerce in Africa, we have seminars to build up capacities in Guinea, in uh, other countries, and we would like to back such action in other African states, but we're limited. We are constrained in terms of costs. So how could these banks assist projects such as ours? Thank you. Okay, so um, that's a question to the, um, perhaps the World Bank and, uh, and, and the African Development Bank. Uh, um, would one of you like to, to respond? Did you get the, uh, you got the interpretation? <clears throat> Would you like to go ahead, uh, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the way to start a partnership is to first start by communication. I'll be happy to meet with you bilaterally and then, you know, you know pass on your information on, on this to the people who are actually technically capable with this, you know, because, you know, we, we can work with people if we know that they're out there. Okay, so perhaps we can get together uh, at the end of the session to follow up on that. Uh, one, one over here. It's okay. Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ibrahim Koulibaly. I'm from Senegal, official delegate. Uh, if you allow, I will uh, speak in French, please. Uh, thank you. Hello. Well, I had two questions. The first, uh, well, I'd like to start off by thanking you for this presentation. All of this was very interesting. It was very dense in terms of information, very rich for Mr. Massimuno, who is the first presenter. I have a question. You had referred to the private-public partnerships between the state and the private sector to finance infrastructure. I believe that this is a very welcome procedure because generally speaking, of course, our states face resource constraints. All states face them. My question, therefore, would be to know, in the laws on private-public partnerships, in Senegal, we're currently updating our laws. Well, I would like to know, what is your view regarding which provisions need to be included in legislation to enable investors in the field of ICTs to be interested in investing in our countries? What should we include specifically? What would an investor look for in our legislation? If you could answer this, uh, or perhaps the other panelists have something to contribute here. And my second question is directed to Ms. Gilwad. She presented some very interesting data. Now, I don't know how one could obtain global data, the data which you have referred to here. I do have some concerns, though, regarding one of these slides. One of the slides where you presented the obstacles, obstacles or barriers to access. 
to the internet, taking into account the problem of energy, electricity. I saw that for Senegal, you said, because of course I'm Senegalese, so I focused on this. You said 50% of individuals simply are not aware of what the internet even is. And next to it, 13% were individuals who don't use the internet. There seems to be some sort of inconsistency here to say that 50% of uh, the population isn't aware of what the internet is and 13% don't use it. I just wanted to understand how you obtain these figures, uh, what sort of uh, data did you include here. It's very interesting for us, for a constructive reason, we would have other views on what we're doing, how we're doing, what stage we're at, because the statistics that we have are the ones which we have gathered ourselves. Thank you. Okay, merci beaucoup, uh, Marcelino. Uh, the question, I th if I understood well, is in terms of uh, legal enabling environment to encourage the prior PPP in the countries and how to motivate them to come, if, if I understood well. Yeah, this is the, the challenge we, we are putting forward and discussing exactly in this forum. I mean, how to encourage these investors to come. Uh, one of the issues that came in, for instance, the taxation that may be an inhibitor, and then the, how to convince the governments to, in their legislation, facilitate foreign investors to come to the country and invest. To, so I don't know, maybe colleagues in the panel that are more versed on the, the legal issues that I am could also jump in if when Mr. Moderator allowed it. Because it all boils down to the enabling environment, both legal and regulatory, that must be attractive for the people to come and invest. Otherwise, they, they go anywhere else. So that's what I can comment. I don't know the specifics of the, the, the legal aspects in Senegal. Uh, Nicholas, got something to add? I'll take, take a brief run at it on, on Senegal, where actually the bank did invest in a, a PPP structure in the Damniadio corridor for the, uh, for the toll road. Um, and actually, my understanding is that you, you've already got an existing um, PPP law and, and, and have gone through that process before. So the, the fundamentals are already in place. Um, hence, hence the investment, I think, back in, uh, some years ago in the Damniadio Corridor. Um, I think that the key thing for us would be less that the legal, legal um, structure, that we'll come back to that. It's actually the pro pro proper project design. So does, do, do we have a clear understanding of what the risks are inherent in the project and who's actually adopting those risks? If we can get past that, that point, then we've got something to dis discuss. And I think, think, as I say, in Senegal, you already ha have a law that, that applies. I think the difficulty is it hasn't applied to ICT. and We haven't done an ICT project. So we need to go through the process of determining what the, ri the individual risk, risks are and who's going to carry them and to what degree and, what, and how do we mitigate those risks, for example, in, in guarantee instruments. Um, particularly where, for example, the government might be, uh, uh, there might be f foreign earnings um, issues and uh, people wish to repatriate money, but the government might do, do something um, that, that would prevent that. There's going to be political risk guarantee in place. So I would say I would worry less about the legal structures, what I'm saying, L worry much more about the actual uh, business structure and who's doing what under it. And that's where the, the, most of the hard yards are gonna be made in this, because that then breaks open what the financing requirements will be and, and, and what the, the, the mitigation on those financial risks are. They're understand, understandable. Um, the, the one big, big issue, uh, legal issue, will be around <coughs> renegotiation. Uh, and that's where you'll get, you know, I would say, fisticuffs in English. That's where you're going to get into a fight about what, what are the rules on, rules on re renegotiation. But they're going to be um, specific to the projects. That would be, be uh, I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, move the second question to Alison. 
Thank you very much for um, both of those interesting questions. I'm just going to tag a little bit, um, refer you to um, a paper on the Research ICT Africa website on public-private interplays, which looks at some of the challenges and really the failures of public-private partnerships in particularly the information infrastructure area, in the um, telecoms infrastructure area. Um, it looks at case studies of Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya. Um, South Africa has very... Um, respected public-private partnership law um, that has been used successfully in a number of other areas, but in fact has not been used successfully um, in relation to infrastructure, uh, information infrastructure, telecom infrastructure. Um, there was an effort by one of our pr provinces to do a very well-developed public-private partnership, which was then stymied by the national rules and treasury rules, etc., that had to go that just weren't flexible enough for this um, arrangement. So that is one of the examples. And what the public-private interplays um, uh, theory and some of the um, evidence that's emerging around this is actually, as I think was implied by what um, Nick was saying, but um, leveraging these partnerships in a, a, perhaps a more informal way. And one of the things I was suggesting earlier that um, getting um, a private sector to finance rollout to underserviced areas by rather investing OPEX by aggregating demand in those underserviced areas, but public demand, um, and in our case, you know, attach a public Wi-Fi to it, et cetera, and get all those other benefits, but actually um, you know, get the um, fiber network, and we've, of course, in South Africa, got many, and many emerging in, in, in Senegal as well, that is closest there, and can, um, it's got very low capital costs, and is basically an open network, so they want as much traffic on it, so they not, haven't got incumbent legacy issues, and they can bring down those costs and deliver those services very quickly, because they need to capitalize that to go into the next project, amortize that to get into the next project. So it could be a very successful model. It's in our um, South Africa Connect broadband plan as, a, as, as one of the solutions and picked up in the Interplays paper. So I, I, that's, I haven't got an example for Senegal in particular. Um, thank you very much for your question um, on, the, on the data. Um, just to recap a little bit, the surveys that were done, in fact, uh, Senegal's was only completed this year. It was part of the second phase um, funding of this project. Um, the project is done, uh, it's a nationally representative survey. It's, the sample is drawn off the uh, census frame. So we do it, we work with the National Statistics Office. And in this case, we worked with the National Regulatory Agency and the USF um, uh, within the ministry. And um, the survey data is completely available to you. Um, it's, as I said, it's just be, been included into this data set, so there would be um, uh, you know, a, a lot more work to be, do, to be done on it. Because, as I mentioned, there are these very interesting performance, um, good performance outcomes um, in terms of internet penetration compared to GNI per capita, et cetera, so about 31%. Um, internet penetration much higher than similar um, countries, or higher than similar, similar other cu um, countries with low um, GNI per capita. But to, to refer to your barriers slide particularly, very important to emphasize, as I said, remember on this slide, we're looking at the barriers to adoption um, for in a country. So if we've got a 31% internet penetration in Senegal, we're looking at what the barriers to adoption are of the 70% who are not connected. Okay, which might still seem, uh, the figures might still seem high for you, but it's the 70% who are not connected. So we've got different barriers to connectivity or to intensity of use for those who are connected. So we're saying of those who are, who are not connected, the device is interestingly less, seems to be less of an issue. The number of people who don't know what the internet in um, Senegal was only exceeded by Lesotho. So it is very high compared to the other countries. Um, but it's not, it's not anomalous that the 50% um, is high and don't know how to use the internet is um, lower at 13%. So what we're trying to distinguish there is um, people who simply don't know what you're talking about. It is very difficult to pick up, and the training in the survey is quite particular about this. We don't know what the internet is. People who say they don't have an interest in the internet, they know what it is, but they don't have an interest, which we have to probe, because often they actually don't know what the internet is and, and, and allocate that way. And then people who actually do know what it is, but they just don't have the skills or the um, knowledge to, you know, basic literacy to get on to, on, online. 
Okay, thank you very much, Alison, and uh, perhaps uh, could also have some further uh, discussion afterwards if you if you like further clarification. Uh, take the right side of the room, uh, starting at the back, uh, the lady in red. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Hamachi Mugala from the East Africa uh, Trade Union Confederation. Um, I'm very excited with these discussions in terms of infrastructure because uh, the previous days we've, we've I've had a lot of discussions around access, and access cannot um, be achieved without proper infrastructure in place. So thank you for, for putting this session together. My question or comments go specifically to Mwangi and uh, the African Development Bank. Um, our infrastructure systems in Africa, uh, uh, roads, uh, ports, and railways are built uh, towards resource e extraction. And I think ICT infrastructure is giving us an opportunity to actually change this narrative and to increase interconnectivity between or within African countries and increase uh, regional uh, uh, integration. I would just like to understand from Wangi if uh, he's been engaged uh, with the PIDA uh, project. That's uh, uh, the project on uh, uh, program for infrastructure development in Africa that I'm sure African Development Bank is one of, uh, one of the key stakeholders in uh, being able to fully uh, implement that. Because for me, reading the PIDA document, it's, it's a very exciting and, and, and a very um, engaging program looking in the future. Because it's a program that is looking into um, multi-stakeholder engagement in pro uh, 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 covering transport, energy, transboundary water, and telecommunication and ICT. So there is a specific pillar within the PIDA program on telecommunication and ICT to facilitate continental integration through regional in infrastructure uh, building. It's between 2012 and 2040, um, and I would just like to know if, if you're engaged in it and what are your thoughts around it. And also just hearing the thoughts from the African Development Bank in terms of financing this and, and pushing it forward. Thank you. Okay, so Nicholas, do you want to start and then? Uh... Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, um, we're aware of the PIDA program, of course, and we, 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 we have a central division um, within um, our, our transport team, it actually infrastructure team that, that deals with PIDA on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, so cl clearly, um, we have as a mandate, uh, stemming back, dating all the way back to uh, 1964, um, when the bank... Um, uh, was set up a mandate to drive regional integration. So we're, we're very much uh, plugged into PIDA. Um, what we're trying to look at is actually the interplay of many of the, the, these things, transport, transport, ICT, uh, electricity. How, how do we use them um, and leverage, uh, leverage the assets of one another to uh, enhance, for example, um, cross-border connectivity to support tra trade facilitation? Um, and so what I think what we'll do within in the PIDA program is just be uh, looking at clever, clever interventions that actually spawn uh, regional integration. At an ICT level, when we talk about integration in terms of just regional connectivity, I think, I think we have to be re reflect on the fact that most, much of that's already being done by the private sector. It's that overlay of, okay, we're, we're developing that. What can we do to, to foster uh, actual economic relations between um, um, neighboring uh, countries. Um, so, so, yeah, we're very much involved with PIDA, but at a level that goes deeper than just an infrastructure expenditure point. Thanks very much. And um, Muchika? Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we've been involved in, with PIDA, uh, but through the African Union uh, Axis Project, which is looking at um, interconnection uh, both at the national level and the sub-regional level and at continental level. As uh, you may have seen some reports a couple of years ago, uh, the AU did 
a study that showed that Africa was spending about $600 million a year to communicate with itself uh, by paying uh, you know, foreign operators um, to, uh, just to exchange traffic or communicate with each other. And so the AXIS project, uh, which we were uh, one of the implementing uh, organizations as a partner, uh, we worked with the African Union to help uh, set up internet exchange points around uh, Africa, basically through capacity building um, and community engagement and also a uh, second part of the activity was on the issue of regional IXPs or regional interconnection, cross-border interconnection. And cross-border interconnection was one of the key things about uh, looking at um, how to address the issue of cross-border connectivity because while there has been some level of cross-border interconnection, um, it's, it's limited and it sort of acts as a gatekeeper. So you'll find the pricing up to the border point is quite affordable, but the moment you cross the border, it becomes expensive. In East Africa, it's a larger issue because of the no man's land. In countries where there's no no man's land, it's a question of competition acro uh, across border. And if you only have one operator, then uh, there's a monopoly, so the pricing becomes an issue. This is something we see in Mozambique, for instance, with a single operator. Um, so, um, uh, and I'm glad to say that there's been some progress. Um, in the Sadak region, CRASA has a committee that, um, uh, the, that's the regulatory association for the Southern African region, has a committee that's looking on this particular issue um, on cross-border interconnection, uh, the, uh, the working group on harmonizing the policy uh, with respect to cross-border interconnection. Uh, this has also happened in Eastern Africa as well, um, and some, there has been some uh, policy interventions which, for instance, uh, operators that are licensed in in Uganda can also come and uh, connect at the exchange point in Kenya without requiring um, a license uh, to connect at the exchange point in Kenya and vice versa. Um, we're also looking at this. Uh, so the activity we did with the African Union was across all the sub-regions, uh, West Africa, um, Central Africa, and North Africa. As a result of that, there has been some, some efforts to support existing exchange points to become uh, regional exchange points where they will grow. Uh, Kenya is one of them. Uh, the Kenya Internet Exchange Point, uh, South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, and then going uh, westbound, there's Nigeria, uh, there's Gabon, and I uh, can't remember all of them, uh, Congo Brazzaville, and then in the north, Egypt. Uh, they will all set up facilities. We'll become like regional hubs uh, or grow the existing exchange points to become regional internet exchange points where networks will cross borders and be able to connect to those facilities to improve the cross-border interconnection. So it's been a key issue and we are hoping that there's a lot more that uh, will continue being done uh, to, to, to resolve because we still see traffic that leaves the continent and goes to Europe, uh, which is destined for Africa. And, and that should not be the case, at least um, in this present day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michuki. Um, Benoit, would you like to add something? Yeah, just uh, two words. I mean, the, uh, the PIDA document is something that the European Union is uh, regularly discussing with the African Union. It was part of the uh, discussion held in Abidjan um, last year. And it's also a, a, a document that uh, leads us <coughs> into our future investments, um, especially for transport and connectivity, but also PIDA is uh, also uh, looking at the um, single um, air market. I think it is important uh, that um, the, the, the countries continue supporting the African Union in making sure that this, uh, I would say, list of investments which are absolutely necessary being prioritized yeah. and that yeah. the investment is looked with the support of the uh, investment banks, the, the BAD and the, the World Bank definitely are key players in that. And the European Union is very much now focusing on uh, blending its resources in order to leverage investment with the banks but also with the private sector. And this, just a word also linked to the question from our colleagues from Senegal is in investment, um, private investors 
have to be attracted into a country, and they can be attracted if first they are aware about the potential of the, of the market in this country, and if they know about the rules that are going to be implemented to them. And uh, clearly, the EU regulation is, is, a, is an heavy one, and uh, nobody really wants this to be the, the one to go across the, um, across the world. But what we have to recognize is that a clear regulation allow private investors to know where they're going to, uh, to invest and gives them incentives uh, to, to settle in different places. So I think we still need to make sure that we're lifting barriers by clarifying the, uh, the situation in each country. Okay, thank you, Benoit. So uh, we'll take the center of the room again. Uh, in the, perhaps it should go to the back. <laughs> we had the, the, at the back of the room. Okay, thank you. My name is Abbas Balima. Uh, I want to speak in French. Okay. I wanted to talk about uh, enlarging connectivity. Does that not uh, fall into the case of an institutional plan? Because if you take the case of uh, Burkina Faso, my country, we are lucky because the government has detaxed the final terminals. That basically means that uh, a computer has no taxes. It costs less. The routers are less costly because of the detaxation. And telephones, I therefore thought that to increase accessibility to the service, we needed to bank on telecommunication networks. In the case of Burkina Faso, for instance, we have a penetration rate of 70%. If therefore we are possible uh, to motivate uh, uh, the communications networks into a competition, that will help improve on the quality of the service. Nicholas Williams has uh, said that we need to motivate investment rather than competition. But I think that uh, that is for developed countries. It applies for developed countries. In less developed countries, it's only through competition that agencies will be able to increase the level of services. For instance, in Burkina Faso, we do not even know what uh, 4G means because we'll not have it. We have uh, the uh, regulatory authority that has patented uh, the licenses uh, of uh, telecommunications for to the third generation, probably not even four years ago. And therefore, if we are able to force uh, communication networks to improve uh, the quality of service, that will encourage uh, the final users to be able to be much more interested in the service, and that therefore will consequently improve on the margins of uh, potential clients, and all the profits will be increased. In the case of Burkina Faso, most people, when they connect themselves, they're only going to uh, have a service, and because connection is expensive, they will disconnect immediately after. And this does not help these telecommunication networks to m win in terms of profit margins uh, from the uh, cost of investment and to be able to improve on the quality of services. Thank you. Uh, well, this uh, relates to the government uh, taxation and, uh, and the use of the Universal Service Fund. I think Nicholas uh, was bringing up those two points. Uh, Nicholas? Well, I'll, I'll clarify what I meant by regulation for investment. If you just regulate for competition, what, what does a competitive outcome look like? And it looks like something that approaches marginal cost. The problem is that we're dealing with an infrastructure industry where you're trying to incentivize investment into infrastructure. And a marginal cost doesn't necessarily leave enough money on the table for future iterations of technologies, 2G, 3G, 4G, or for alternative business um, uh, models. And so my concern is if we get run away with concepts of, of competition regulation without taking a, a robust view on what money is required to be left on the table in order to incentivize further investment, all we'll get is um, metro, metro um, networks. They'll be deep. You'll have a sundry other number of services but you won't get 
widespread deployment. And I think we've seen that, and uh, you know, I'll let Benoit disagree with me in due course, but uh, you know, I, I'm kind of critical of some of the decisions taken by European regulators in the 2000s where they went gung-ho after mobile termination rate regulation and then they went after roaming regulation. The problem being there is you start un un unbundling the bundle of services and you pick out those bits that are more expensive than others. You're actually left with a bundle that actually doesn't make a ton of money for anyone. And what we've seen in Europe, to, in my view, is Europe fall behind Asia and America on investment into 4G and 5G, simply because there isn't enough money left on the table and that we've had a gung-ho approach to, to just looking at competition. And as I say, if you just look at competition under the normal competition policy sort of re regime, you're in danger looking at marginal returns. And so that's my concern. I don't disagree with you that the regulator has a role to play to ensure that the consumer is pre adequately protected. But in doing so, I think he needs to look at through the, through the lens of investment so that he doesn't, not only does he not starve existing players potentially of the ability to expand their business, but he also doesn't make the pricing such that it's wholly unattractive for other business models even to attempt at market entry. That's, that's the point. And so I'd like to, to extend, extend the, um, uh, the, the focus, if you like, so it's not just on competition. Um, there is the issue of, of a universal service fund. I think I, I mentioned it earlier. I think we just need to be clever about how we, how we put that in. I think one of the lessons I've learned today is also not think of it only in terms of providing money to mobile operators, but how do you actually use that money to, to invigorate um, new entrant and alternative uh, business models uh, for, 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 uh, for, for coverage so that we actually see what can be scaled up. We start enabling um, innovative smaller companies to scale up faster where there's an obvious business case that can actually work. I'll leave it there. Well, Benoit is itching to uh, speak, I can see. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think yesterday the, uh, the Vice President uh, acknowledged some of the limits of what has been uh, done in, uh, in Europe and why it was so important to ensure that the open market, the digital open market, was really taking place. Because what we have seen is we had the technology, 4Gs, and we had the investments and the accessibility. <coughs> But the innovation, all the startups, all the, um, not all, but let's say a lot of them, were moving to the US where they had an open market of much bigger than the one in Europe. And I think th the issue was not so much on getting the cost down because I'm sure you know that the telecom uh, companies in Europe are still making good profit. <laughs> Um, the, the issue was that the quantity of services, the quantity of uh, application and um, provided to the cost, to final customers was not as much as it could have been. So the, the, global service, the whole sector has not grown as quickly as expected because um, a French company would have limits to work with the German market or with the uh, market in Spain, in Italy, not only because of languages, but also because of limitation in the regulation systems and the openness of the market. So I think it is very important to make sure that whenever we develop a, an IT um, system and we want to promote e-commerce, we ensure that from the very beginning we provide access to as many customers as possible. Because the innovation comes when the access is there. And you see that in, in some countries in Africa where connection exists, you see that a lot of people are doing many things. And there is a lot of innovation going on. And this is what is thriving, really, the, uh, this sector. And this is also the interest of it. Is give the possibility to people to do, and you will see how quickly they, they pick up. 
it's, it's amazing. But if you do so, you have to make sure that they have a market which is big enough. And the European market was so, so divided that we have not get, got the, all the benefits. And I think it's in, in December now, this year, that the European digital market will exist. I'm sure that in the coming years, we'll see a big change once the, everybody will have access to it. And if I may, I think it, another thing which is important is you need to have uh, showcases. And one element which I think in Europe has been very important to allow the development of internet has been the integration of all the research community and the education community to high-speed band. And I think that in Africa we are working with the Internet Society also on this in trying to ensure that researchers' university are connected to high-speed band. And here you see that one of the limits is the cost of access. And here really you need to have regulation that gives, uh, I mean, the conditions to, in order to allow researchers in Africa to be able to do all their calculation with the computers wherever in the world they need. And these people in the coming years will become the one that will also push for better, uh, better services in, in countries. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, to be fair, there is a gentleman right at the back of the center uh, with a beard. So, <laughs> fair, to be fair, I'll let the, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. I didn't, I didn't think you were going to call me. I've been lifting my hand up a few times already. So, um, my name is Lenny Joseph. I'm the CEO of Joseph Max. So, uh, we have expertise in smart cities and telecommunications for over the years and digital transformations. So, I'm going to frame up more than a question, more of a proposal of a solution framework that we could possibly work with, right? So to set the stage for it, we, we all agree that the objective is to get as many people connected as possible in Africa. And when you look at it from that spectrum, we've got the private enterprise, the companies that are interested in making revenue, um, and these are all the big telecom providers out there. We've got the government that's responsible for regulation, and you've got people that we should be interested in more from a human development standpoint, and that's the reason why we want to get them connected. And when I go back a step, the government is responsible for putting the regulations in place. And I am with Nivi completely that there is a stranglehold in terms of the regulations that have been put in place. These regulations in telecommunications were developed years ago when we didn't have a good understanding overall in, in the world about how telecommunications work. Now that we do, to a certain extent, the bandwidths are completely blocked out. And, I, and, and I'll go down to what Nicholas was saying, that you know, we need to talk about you know, incentivizing instead of competition, more for incentivize for investment. I think of it more from a level playing field standpoint. So what we should be thinking about is putting regulations in place that if we want to maintain the current regulations that are there, we make it mandatory that either it's a telecom provider that gets into any of the African countries, that as part of providing telecommunications in that country, they put in the infrastructure required in all the rural areas. And once you do that, you will create a level playing field for everyone that wants to play in that market. And we tell them that they should go ahead and figure out the business model that will make it profitable for them. Now, that, that way, they still have the competition. It's a level playing field. Now, if they're not willing to do that, you need to open up the bandwidth. You need to open up the bandwidth for folks like Nivi, myself, and other entrepreneurs that know what to do with the wildest spectrum. And this goes down the path. Right now, we talk about 5G. There is a move right now within the big automotive manufacturers and the rest of them in Europe right now saying that we're going to have private 5G networks without involving the telecom, the, the telecom providers primarily because IoT is moving so fast and we need to leverage it. So it's more of a framework of a solution that I'm proposing here, but I think it's something that needs to be considered. If we can think of having private 5G networks in Europe, in manufacturing and the rest of it, I think it should be possible for us to have private networks, whether it's in 2G or 3G or whatever spectrum you want to define in rural areas. If telecom providers are not willing to provide it, open it up. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that contribution. 
So, any more questions on the left? We only got ten minutes. None on the left. Uh, go to the oh, plenty on the right. <laughs> Start at the front. Uh, gentleman in the white shirt. Um, I just want to ask one uh, question uh, with relating to an Alison. So I'm from South Africa. Um, my name is Tebo Kholoate. So I head up the e-commerce working group as of an e-commerce advisory committee um, advising the ministries uh, related to e-commerce. Now, what we saw, I think, in, in our situation in South Africa, we recently published our national ICT policy-wide paper. Um, and coming out of that white paper, we saw a lot of supply-side interventions uh, in that. So I'm actually quite um, refreshed to, to hear a lot of demand-side uh, suggestions being put on the table. Um, as what Nick, uh, Nicholas was saying, uh, at the end of the day, it's a business case uh, scenario. Now, I just want to ask Alison with regards to um, in our environment, this whole debacle around the issue of a wholesale open access network operator um, as a, a vehicle to possibly provide inclusion and, um, and universal access uh, as opposed to uh, you know, relying solely on, on universal uh, access funds. Uh, what your view is with regards to the model that's been proposed currently and whether we've seen elsewhere in the world where the one has delivered uh, inclusion and universal access. Thanks. Alison, can you be... Uh... Um, I'll try and keep the issues as broad as possible so that they have interest to everybody else because I think it has been a, a very um, complicated and, and nitty-gritty long process. Um, but uh, just to say that you're absolutely correct that the very protected ICT um, green and white paper process has prioritized um, supply side issues. And there is brief reference to the demand side challenges. I think we've got a better framework within our broadband plan within SA Connect, although it's obviously just the very broad bones, but it identifies you know, the, the infrastructural issues and then the digital development kinds of issues and the skills issues, lo localization, content development, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, Absolutely, that framework has to be right for you know, e-commerce and digital um, uh, uh, economy to, to function. Um, I think South Africa is a very good case in point where we've had, we were one of the first countries, I mean, really at the global level, you know, in line with the, the, the um, global north, to introduce the Electronic Communications Transactions Act, I think back in 2000 or something like that, um, of which, you know, about 20 or 30 percent was implemented by this review phase now that we're going into um, in order to um, amend the legislation and do stuff. So it, we really have to create legislation and policy that is aligned with our um, political economy aligned with our institutional capacity, aligned with our um, human development challenges, which, as I said, in South Africa, because of our inequalities, are as great as, as anywhere else, although the figures look good at the high level. Um, really getting everybody online, productively online, not just from a consumption point of view, is an enormous, is a bigger challenge for us. And the solutions, because we know they're educational, um, are, you know, big intergenerational issues that will take a very long time to fix. Um, uh, on that note, I think the intervention around the wireless open access network, which I have um, written extensively on and researched extensively on, and we have a paper on the website that you could look at, um, I, 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 think we, um, I think it's highly risky. Um, I think the modifications to it now would enable smaller players to come online, as, be, as has been suggested. Um, but I think the objectives of it are probably um, not, um, the, the intentions of it are not going to be reached. Um, the intentions of uh, bringing SMMEs online, of bringing, um, getting black em economic empowerment into our spectrum, which is very un unrepresented, these are not the right mechanisms to get those outcomes. Um, I think if we look at the only model that's been introduced in Mexico, this has been a very protracted high-risk model, um, so high-risk that they've actually created a separate company to the Red Compartida to introduce the um, uh, digital dividend spectrum um, open access wireless network um, so that the state, if this collapses, can still hold on the spectrum and reissue it elsewhere. Um, the, uh, oper it is now operational. It's taken seven years for this process to um, um, unfold. It's 
um, you know, quite bizarrely in many ways, to be honest, um, implemented at a constitutional level, so people have to go forward with this. Um, the thing that the constitution reform did do is actually allow independent asymmetrical regulation. And I think the important point is that during this time, through um, in independent um, asymmetrical re regulation, they have actually reduced the dominance um, of um, America Mobitel um, from the 80% which it was to um, about 60%. So I think you know th there are lots of other ways of getting people in line, dealing with the dominance um, in the market. And it, I was just going to say the final thing is really to tap on what I was saying at the end of my speech and what we've heard here, is that we have to find the, the, the big backbone investments, the big, um, whether it's um, uh, you know, fiber or even in the mobile environment, the backhaul networks for that, will come from the big operators. Um, that we've got to create a, an evolution for these businesses to grow and for us to remain competitive and to give operators access to that spectrum. The opportunity costs of us having not granted spectrum for over 10 years, we have not granted spectrum in South Africa. Um, the cost, our high cost of communication is because operators have had to refarm 3G, 2G spectrum in order to offer 4G services because our 4G spectrum still isn't available. So there are much more complex issues around the WOAN and I think they're far less risky ways allowing um, um, uh, low-cost operators to come into the market, allowing that secondary use of spectrum, allowing you know, network operators to um, operate, providing complementary access through public Wi-Fi, using um, Universal Service Fund, if you need one at all. Um, I should just add one last point on that, sorry, because I think this is the thing is we still speak about the Universal Service Funds as if this is an optimal way to get connectivity. And I think we can see that there are many other solutions that could be done. So you could support these small operators to do it, but let's stop thinking about the value in um, the infrastructure. Let's think about the value in the data. These mobile companies and Perhaps platforms... You could, uh, follow yeah. up. Uh, at Sorry, the end of the session, say, we because uh, we've got three minutes data. left. Yeah. yeah, perhaps you can continue the discussion uh, at the end of the session. Uh, we just got a few more minutes. Let's take the centre of the room again, the gentleman in the front. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Trimo Chaurura. I am the deputy director for digital health in the Ministry of Health and Child Care, Zimbabwe. So I took a keen interest in Michuki's presentation. Um, I would like to engage, I think, uh, uh, later on uh, with my colleague here. But basically, I'm seeing a lot of uh, lack of innovation in the way we are approaching e-commerce in Africa, especially in Zimbabwe, because look at Kenya, for instance, the most profound innovation we have around e-commerce and digital space is M-Pesa. But what else did we do after M-Pesa? We replicated that in Zimbabwe with EcoCash, but what else do we do after EcoCash? So I think a lot of our funding must go towards innovative innovation so that we, 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 we invent something new, not just look for bankable projects. Our problem is as uh, investors, we are looking for readily bankable projects, and that is a very big mistake. Um, and then digital responsibility, I think the lady uh, third from my right, you mentioned a lot about uh, how pornography is then finding its way in the digital maze. Um, I think we also need to be responsible on how we can regulate and how we can sort of um, stop uh, uh, wastages that uh, go towards uh, uh, use abuse of uh, the digital space. For instance, you would find that um, at most government entities, people are actually using YouTube uh, for other, you know, causes that are not even work-related. They are chewing up the bandwidth um, uh, against, you know, uh, the, 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 the tenets of the institution to be responsible uh, at work. I think uh, we also owe a lot um, of innovation in order to utilize the last mile connectivity. Uh, we have a lot of uh, connected health facilities in Rambinda. I don't know if you're aware of that, um, but we don't have applications that are running, you know, on those uh, connected uh, hospitals. So basically, we need to innovate. We need to take use of uh, the digital you know, uh, space or infrastructure that we then create at the end of the day. OK, well, um, perhaps I could ask one of our innovators, uh, Nivi, uh, to respond to that. And uh, that will be the last, uh, because we've run out of time now. Uh, so just to be clear, we're really strong proponents of the free and open internet. So if people choose to spend their time 
on pornography on sports betting websites, then that's a choice. But I think it's um, a responsibility to provide people with not a walled garden internet experience, but also the digital literacy and the awareness and knowledge on how to uh, utilize that uh, opportunity and potential well. Um, but I think you're just echoing something that I've said and I've heard uh, uh, Kenyan call Oreo Kolo say, which is we can't entrepreneur and innovate our way out of everything. At some point, government has to step up. At some point, regulation has to change, both on paper and in practice. And those are two different things. Um, and you know that, that's really where the space where, where innovation happens and innovators and entrepreneurs are able to do um, and have me meaningful impact. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, let me uh, thank uh, uh, all the panelists for extremely interesting uh, presentations and, and information. Uh, we've run out of time. It's amazing that uh, we've actually gone through uh, three hours. Uh, so congratulations on your uh, attention span uh, extending so far. It's very nice to see uh, so much interest in the room on this critical issue of, uh, of connectivity. Uh, without it, of course, uh, we can't achieve any of the sustainable development goals, let alone digital economy and e-commerce. And, um, and it's clear that it's not just a question of uh, connectivity, but the, uh, the cost, the affordability uh, of connecting. And we've heard a lot of ways of um, we could reduce that cost. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, common ideas have come out of this, both uh, from the panel and uh, in the floor. Um, we've got a number of different uh, organizations in this panel, and it's very nice to, say, to see that uh, we're all uh, more or less saying the same thing. Uh, we need to uh, collaborate together, uh, all these different organizations, and uh, work towards uh, achieving these uh, common goals that we've identified. So I know there were still a few uh, people with uh, questions, but perhaps I, I could invite you to, uh, to approach uh, some of the panelists if they're not having to dash away um, to, to answer those questions. And so let me ask you to join me in giving uh, a good round of applause to all our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you and enjoy the rest of uh, Kenya's National Day. <laughs>